So good afternoon, good evening. Um, it's Monday, May 9, and here we are, another day in paradise. Really a very special uh, room today. My good friend Ian Harnett from ASR Research, who I've known for decades. Another old, older Caucasian male, <laughs> but Ian, yeah, sorry about that. Um, he's come from London. It's the first trip to the States in a couple of years since COVID. And really excited to have Ian in the house. And Ian came out with a new report last week. I've known Ian for 25, 30 years. Yeah, 25 years. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I've known, I've known his colleague David Bowers from Smith Newcourt days going back 35 years. And David, who can't be with us right now, for those of you um, that may have not heard of ASR, you've probably heard of, of, of Warburgs and UBS. Ian worked, worked for UBS. And David Bowers, his colleague, was the global equity strategist for Merrill Lynch when it was called Merrill Lynch back in the day. Uh, immediately, I think, uh, following Chuck Clow and then uh, before uh, Rich Bernstein. So these are sharp cookies. They're vet grizzled veterans. It's who you want in the room in a market like this. Just to remind everyone, this is not about picks in the stock of the week. We're trying to get the big picture right, and we've certainly done that. And so before we go to Ian, just to uh, – you know, obviously, everyone wants to know what's going on. Uh, the house is caught on fire. For anyone who's been in these rooms for the last four or five months, this comes as no surprise. Obviously, trying to figure out the market day to day is a fool's errand, and that's not what this market, this room is all about. But trying to get the direction right, we've done, a, I think, a pretty good job of that. And I know I got a little bit uh, hyperbolic with my twi twi tweet storm over the weekend. For those of you that were in the room on uh, Saturday, we had a five and a half hour session. That's <laughs> crazy. You guys are gluttons for punishment. It was raining. I had nothing else to do, so why not? Uh, I apologize that the replay of that um, room is not up yet. It will be up in the next day or two. But for those of you that didn't hear that, there was the recording. We had the room on Thursday night, which, again, I will say is the greatest Twitter space in the history of Twitter. It was truly an all-star lineup. Tom Thornton, who's going to be kicking off in a second, was, was one of our featured speakers, as was Michael Kantrowitz. Michael, good to see you again. Uh, we had um, Michael Belkin, Tony Greer. Uh, Dr. Anasa Haji, uh, missing somebody, Bob Justick. I mean, it was just an all-star room. It's rare you get one of those guys in public to speak. We had six of them. So at any rate, um, you know, the market has no institutional memory day to day. The reason I tweeted out, a, 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 I used the word crash in the room on Saturday was not to draw more Twitter followers. We're growing organically without that. It was because I was just overcome by the extraordinary flow statistics. And Ian, maybe later, if, um, if Mr. McBain has a sentiment data and his flow data, I'd love to hear about that. That in the face of a collapsing market, we've seen very little outflows. We saw, I think, uh, Shrub is not here. We had, I think, 19 billion one week, 13 billion another week. It was like, you know, 33 billion against the backdrop of over a trillion of inflows last year. And the denial. Again, denial is not, not the name of a river in Egypt. The complacency, the macro unawareness, and frankly, the pushback I got from people. I mean, I, I, I just couldn't believe it. The arguments we got from some people in the room on uh, Saturday. And, you know, they always say that, you know, I'll restrain myself. They always say you should, <laughs> you should, you could praise specifically, but only, but, but only uh, criticize generally. I'll bite my tongue. But for anybody who was in the room, and you know who I'm talking about, we had this growth investor in there talking about how, like, the only reason oil is that, you know, where it is is because of Russia. I'm like, dude, really? You're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts, as Senator Moynihan famously once said. And so there's this lack of macro awareness, this, this denial. Uh, this, it's about positioning. Everyone stocks for the long term. Jeremy Siegel, please call your office. We'll make 9% a year. Entry point doesn't matter. In any event, enough of this. So I want to move to Tom Thornton. Um, Tommy's a big friend of this room. He's been in here a lot. And, 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 and Tommy, we'll keep it brief because I know you got a hard stop because your wife is coming home. Everyone's here not to listen to you. They want to listen to Ian. It's a little bit of a bait and switch here. But um, 
So, Tommy, why don't you kick it off and, um, you know, just give us a, an update. You've been in the rooms quite a lot. You Most recently, you were in on Thursday night. And just give us sort of a mark-to-mark at how things have progressed and what's sort of top of mind for you. Tommy, please take it away. Well, hey, thanks, George. Um, boy, um, another uh, 3% day. This is the um, third 3% day uh, in the last week. And I, I think we're working on, is it five weeks now down? And yeah, things are, things have been and continue to be oversold. And just saying that it's oversold doesn't mean it's a buy. And there's a sentiment as well is getting extremely overdone. But as I've said to George, sentiment can stay oversold. Uh, it's a condition. And for example, we've had the U.S. dollar bullish sentiment uh, extreme for nine months and you've had bonds uh, in the seller, uh, extremely bearish sentiment for, for months now. Um, I use the daily sentiment index, and I, I have charts on, on my um, site. And S&P and NASDAQ hit 9% today. And that's real, real low. Uh, anytime it's under 10%, it's pretty significant. Uh, Bitcoin hit 8% today. And I think that is the lowest I've ever seen the Bitcoin bullish sentiment. And, and this is an actually a newer one that started after 2018. So things market sentiment wise is pretty scary out there. Um, the CNN fear and greed, which I, I actually really like this one, because it's not what traders are telling you they're thinking. It's actually showing through seven different uh, market metrics. Um, and you can see they just redid it on their site. And it's good. It's now just ticked into extreme fear. It's at 22, I believe. And I've seen it lower. In March of 2020, on the 23rd, I think, it hit one. So yeah, that was pretty bad. I, I took a snapshot of it because I thought I'll probably never see that again. Uh, there were a lot of the, the breath was awful with the NYSE down almost 3,400 issues and 3,350 for the NASDAQ. So it, breath was absolutely terrible. I mean, that's a really bad number, uh, to be quite honest. Um, I was looking at the high-low data, and we haven't really seen a lot of the high-low data jump out yet. And I think that right now, you, for the NASDAQ, there were 32 new 52-week lows, no new highs, obviously. Uh, and the S&P, I think we had 100 and just over 100. So we're, we have 32% in the NASDAQ 100 and about 20% in the um, S&P. It should go lower before we see some sort of bottom. Now, I am known for tracking DeMarc indicators, and they've worked really, really well. They, work, tend, they tend to work really well in volatile markets. And I've talked about how through a whole, I guess through the whole year that we'd see a pattern of uh, lower highs and lower lows, which is continuing. The DeMarc indicators right now on the S&P, Spiders, uh, NDX, and the Qs, they're a little, and the futures, they're a little off, but let's just say they're, they range from day eight to day 11 out of 13. And I wanna see those 13s complete and that could happen this week if we continue uh, to continue lower. It may be next week, but because they don't have to happen in exact order, which the sequential is the most poorly named indicator I, um, ever. But the bottom line is uh, I'll be tweeting out stuff and uh, putting out stuff when these do happen, when this does happen. So combining market sentiment at oversold levels and the DeMarc indicators, I've done this before, you can get a tradable bounce that you can exploit. I had a lot of people today ask me if a downtick in the CPI on Wednesday could spark a rally. Sure, it could. I mean, we've seen, you know, Steve Leisman ask um, Powell if 75 basis points is off the table. And he said yes, and the market ripped. So we could see something like that. But I still think that there's a, a real problem with inflation. It's moderating the, the Bloomberg Commodity Index took a big drop today. And I've been saying also that commodities maybe not are going down dramatically, but I think they were going to top out. And that could be multi-week, multi-month. Uh, there's still things that are going higher. 
Uh, I think gasoline could probably still go higher, especially as we get into the summer. And right now, I think that my I'm I have shorts, I have longs. Longs absolutely suck right now. I'm very very cash heavy. I have almost fifty percent in cash. I have some put spreads on various things that are making money, but I'm nervous. I'm a nervous bear thinking that the market could, you could see some sort of rip roaring rally for no particular reason. Um, a friend of mine um, who worked for Linda Brashke said the NAR rally, the no apparent reason rally that could happen. And so I'm really cautious of that. I do want to see the DeMarc signals exhaust on the downside uh, that could happen again this week or, or next, and and then and then we get something going up now, and and it could be like a you could have a ten percent bounce, and we could see that's easily possible. Uh, Bitcoin, let's talk about that. That I think is a real um, very uh, tricky thing right now. It's on day nine of thirteen. Uh, we nearly came through uh, thirty thousand today, which is the big round number, and I think that's. It means nothing, but I, I think that, or the number means nothing, but I think the main thing is that um, yeah, people will probably become more motivated to sell and nothing motivates sellers more than uh, the fear or the actual, um, actually losing money. So that I think is a real important um, issue right now. Uh, that could be, if that waterfalls again uh, tomorrow or this week, I think that that could cause more risk off in the NASDAQ. It could cause more risk off in all sorts of different places. And remember in these types of markets that are super illiquid where you had tons of inflows and Michael Harnett uh, at Bank, Bank of America today said that with all the trillion dollar of inflows, they calculate that only 3% has they've redeemed. And their average cost is around 42.75 in the S&P. So again, if we continue lower, I think there's a lot of fuel to burn um, moving this market lower. There's a lot of supply that could hit the market and cause some real damage. But again, I'm a nervous bear. I'm cognizant of you know some rip roaring rallies that could, could come out of nowhere. So right now, I think it's a cautious time. There's a lot of different moving pieces. And one last thing, the bond market actually caught a bid today. And I think it was the first time in quite a while that it was a risk off flight to safety move in the bond market. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. And yes, I have to cut it a little short. If anybody has any questions, they can email me um, at uh, info at hedgefundtelemetry.com. And my wife's coming home from uh, a trip, and if I'm not there cleaning up all the, you know, the fun I had, uh, I could be in real trouble. Hey, hey, Tommy, do you have time for one question? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And by the way, you're kind of breaking up. I don't know what's going on there. So just if you could, it's getting worse. So uh, I want to recognize Michael Guyad. If you have a question for Tom Thornton, because he's only going to be with us for a few more minutes. If you, Michael Guyad, if you have a question, yeah, Tommy, yeah, great. Uh, re- yeah. Go, go yeah, no, I appreciate it. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll add a couple of quick thoughts after this, but because um, I just caught a little bit of the end of this, uh, Tommy. So um, you mentioned the rip roaring rally. Today was interesting. Maybe it's just faces in the cloud, but the fact that there was such a pretty big intraday turnaround in ten-year uh, Treasury yields, I think, was really quite interesting. Okay, and I say that because if the bond market went through capitulation last week, which I think is what's happened, which selfishly I really need for my funds to really work. Well, then conceivably that rip facing, you know, rip your face off rally could be imminent for stocks before ultimately making lower lows. Because if the bond market is seeing inflation as maybe coming down faster than what the narrative is, well, then the initial reaction by the stock market should be a positive one. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on that idea for a moment. Okay, I'm on speaker now. Uh, I, yeah, you could you that could be seen as a positive. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be seen as a positive if rates start to moderate. Yes, that it, they're still high, and I, I think there there's still risk with credit spreads. I I looked at credit spreads, and they those are widening. They have Demark 
uh, signals that are still in play that suggest that they could go even wider. I think that's still a big risk. Um, so, yeah, it's a first day of risk off uh, move type for bonds, but I, I still think that you're going to have a rough time in the bond market. It's not going to be, we're, we're not going back, you know, six months ago, we're not going back there. No, and, and I would say I agree. I think spreads could could be the next phase of, of rising rates, right? Credit spreads really blowing out. My suggestion is that if that happens, that's what classic risk off looks like. So treasuries would rally, yields would drop. Now you have default risk premiums getting priced in. So it looks like the bond market keeps on selling off, but it's more consistent with the way you tend to see high volatile regimes and equities. Yeah, I, I'm looking at like right now, the high yield five-year spread, CDX, day four of 13, and the investment grade's a little further along. So you could see um, a bit of a pullback. But right now, if you look at a longer term of credit spreads, I think we're a little wider than the December 2018. So that that was something I was looking at today. Uh, but we're not anywhere near the panic of 2020. I don't think we're going to get there. Thanks for that, Tommy. So we're going to let you run off to catch your bride. This has been awesome. Um, Michael Guy, why don't you stay up there? Because I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. And if you've got the time, I'm sure a lot of people like to pick your brain. Usually the one doing the questioning. Maybe it'd be nice to turn the tables and have people question you. Um, okay, so let's go to the man of the hour. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got um, Ian Harnett. Not to be confused with Michael Hartnett. <laughs> okay, but they're both bearish. And Ian's an old friend, um, as I said, a grizzled veteran. He's been through the wars. He's seen cycles. And one of the things I find very upsetting in the current environment is the new investor class who only knows the post, post-great post financial crisis environment where, you know, it's buy the dip, FOMO, TINA, it's a, the Fed's got your back, there's a Fed put, that that's all changing now. And I'm not much of a yachtsman, but it's sort of when the direction of the wind changes and you got to come about, like, if you're still thinking you can keep on doing the old thing, it's not going to work. So um, it's great. To, Ian's an independent thinker, works for ASR Research. Um, by the way, one thing before I forget, um, as all you know, um, Tom Thornton is the prior of hedge fund telemetry. I have no commercial relationship with him, but he's been in the room you know, numerous times, a huge friend of the room. Helped a ton of people. Um, if you reach out to him, I think he's running a discount again uh, on his service. Um, I read it every day. Uh, I urge you to do to do likewise. Again, I have no commercial relationship with Tommy, but it's just especially the discount he's offering is an incredible value. So I can't urge strongly enough for to take a look at Tommy's research product. I'm not sure if he does trials anymore, but I mean he's, he's offering a huge discount right now. All right, so Mr. Harnett, good to see you. Uh, your first trip to the states since, since when Ian? Oh, since uh, probably January 2020 was the last time that I was out here. And, when, uh, and, when, and just before we get into markets, when did you actually r- arrive here in the states? Um, we got here uh, in the middle of last week, George. You know, my so, business partner David Baz and myself. So yeah, we've been uh, we've been here for a few days. Had a few questions. Had quite a few meetings. So before we get to markets, I'm just sort of curious. Um, it's often quite useful when you go to a place that you frequently travel to and you, you've been away for a while and then you revisit oftentimes something strikes you as being different you know the you know the, the tree the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the sky is bluer the women are more good looking you know the clients are nastier I, so, I, so so what would you say on this trip both in terms of what you observe just as america and then also just in terms of the questions and attitudes you're getting from clients so i think that the the two things that uh, struck us were the weekend it was just humming absolutely humming uh, you know, the restaurants, getting places, you know, the air fl- flights we've taken, just been really super busy. The other thing was this morning, walking up 6th Avenue was really easy. Whereas, you know, <laughs> you know, for the last 20 years, 30 years, when I've been coming every quarter to the U.S., um, you know, since 1996, religiously every quarter, George, as you know, um, you know, walking up 6th Avenue Monday morning, everybody would be bustling right. down the other right. way. You know, you'd be you know, fighting your way right. through. No problem. And, Today, no problem whatsoever. Definitely didn't need Excellent. to take a taxi. So, Ian, what about the clients? Often, um, judging by what's asked as well as what's not asked, sometimes it's more interesting in terms of what's not asked. Could you just speak a little bit to 
what you found interesting, what's been surprised, what's been sort of top of mind for the clients and, and what's, what surprised you about the conversations? So I think the thing that's been um, top of mind for the conversation, obviously, is the, you know, the markets uh, seller setting off. So one of the key questions has been, you know, are we at the bottom? Are we halfway through? Um, so, you know, we, I'm sure we'll be talking about that on, on today's space, George. Um, the other thing has been the question about, you know, the consumer. Surely, you know, if you can't be talking about the risks of recession if you've got, you know, this kind of level of consumer balance sheet, you know, you must be out of your minds. The question that hasn't been asked so much is what about earnings? There's this focus on it being a consumer recession rather than a corporate problem. And that's where we would point people to because we are now forecasting. Anyone there or no? Something went dead. Bobby, can you hear me? Absolutely. Loud right. and clear. All right. So let's go back to where we were. I'm terribly sorry for this, but. We've seen that Twitter is having a bad hair day. So let's go back to where we were, our regularly scheduled programming. Ian, so you're starting to talk about your variant perception and what are the key drivers in the market? I know you recently put out a report last week, I had a chance to read it, where you become decidedly more downbeat about the world economic view and earnings. So maybe that's a good place to start. Where do you think we are in the cycle? And, and of course, you know, the point of this room is not to try to figure out the market day to day, week to week. We can't do that. Um, it's more sort of big picture stuff. So Talk about where we are in the cycle. What do you think the market's not fully appreciating? What's your variant perception, your view? Of, I think we can start with your, your view of global growth and earnings. Yeah, so the global growth picture, George, you know, I think is one that is um, much weaker than the perception in the marketplace. You know, if, um, when we talk to institutional clients, I think they feel that we're you know, um, heading downwards, but slowly and that the, you know, the, the, the potential is still there, particularly here in the United States, for economic growth to be strong. We think there's a very different picture, which is that globally there is a synchronized slowdown taking place. We like using what's called a diffusion indicator of PMIs. So that's just whether, you know, are these PMIs up or down relative to where they were three months ago, six months or 12 months ago? And we're seeing those right the way across the board disappointing whether it's manufacturing or whether it's services so we think this is going to morph into a recession and you know the bank of england's really has, you know put the cat among sufficient pigeons this week with um by coming out and saying that as well we think that the eurozone and the ecb will be talking about that next and the us will not be able to escape this now what that means is that the big complacency that is out there at the moment in terms of the institutional client base, we would say, and when we see, when we look at the uh, overall numbers, is that those IBES forecasts of the next 12 months earnings are still running in high single digit numbers, and it's going to be down five, down 10. And in places like the Eurozone, some of our models, George, are talking about minus 20%. And the IBES numbers- Minus still, 20% with earnings? Earnings, yep. And the IBS numbers are still saying plus eight. So, you know, those earnings numbers are, you know, coming through and they're going to come down really dramatically because, you know, you can't keep on pricing, carrying on pushing through these price increases forever. And the thing that in the past has really killed margins is not the, the earnings going up. Uh, sorry, the cost pressures going up from wages. It's actually when demand starts to come down. And so that demand slowdown is going to be the thing that kills you. And, you know, that's going to be a world where break evens come down 50 basis points, 100 basis points as the ISM loses 10 to 15 points. So, you know, it's a much weaker economic environment. And that means I don't think you're actually going to see stagflation here. I think you're just going to see recession. Really? Yeah. So, you know, I think the stagflation risks are overstated because there is supply out there. We're seeing commodity prices already. Even before today, we were starting to see the year on year rate of commodity prices flat. Break evens were flat year on year. And if oil inventories start to come back in, those oil prices are going to come back down as well. And quite honestly, the bond market is not telling you that, you know, there's a stagflation risk. To get stagflation in the bond market, you need the two-year going through the 10-year and the 30-year. And actually, you've got to have a Fed funds rate above both the 10-year and the 30-year. And those, those yields have got to be rising as well. So, you know, for me, it's much more of just a straightforward recession. We think the Fed, 
you know, will, are actually targeting. If they want to get inflation down, they've got to target a weaker housing market, you know, because of that share of CPI, you know, from shelter, 30 percent in shelter, 40 percent in core. So the Fed, you know, their errors that they made in terms of pushing uh, inflation up in the housing market, that was up 20 percent. They now, to get the inflation down, they've got to get core inflation. Uh, they've got to get house prices down as well. So the bottom line here, George, is that, you know, you're going to see, I think, I don't think the Fed's going to be able to carry on pushing through these rate rises. That slowdown, the housing slowdown, you know, the endogenous, you know, that's, sorry, the it, Sometimes I pretend to be a proper economist. Wait, wait, I, it it is, and then he uses British stuff, cat amongst the pigeons. I mean, oh, dude, no, I, mean, awful, I, mean, I mean, dude, it's two people separated okay. by a common language. So, okay? uh, so endogenous. It, I know Bob, Bob, Bobby J. I, I'm ask, I, I know, of it, course, what it means. I'm asking for Bobby J. So could you please tell us what endogenous so means? It just means the bit that the market is doing is tightening. So everybody focuses on the Fed. But what the market does is a tightening of liquidity. I know you, a lot of your spaces have talked about this, George, that rise in bond yields that we've seen, you know, that is really killing. That's going to kill economic activity. It's going to push the ISM down below 50 in the next 12 months. The rising mortgage rates, you know, it's the biggest rise in mortgage rates in 12 months since 19, 1994. You know, housing confidence is at its worst level since the SNL crisis in 19 in the early 1980s. You know, this is not a world um, where economic growth is marginally going to slow. It's going to be aggressive. And yet at the same time, we've still got this confidence that bond yields are going to go to uh, the Fed funds is going to go over three. That's not going to happen in. You know, I want to be buying bonds here. Our bond equity yield ratio model, which tells you the refer relative preference between bonds and equities. It's not about Tina. It's about you know how quickly rates go up and how quickly the equity market has gone up. That is giving you a bear market signal for the first time for a number of years. And that says to me, I want to buy bonds and I want to sell equities. And you know, the place where I want to buy bonds most is actually Germany. You okay. know, that kind of okay. that so, kind so, of so, world so, that kind of world okay. so, where so, so, so Ian, let me interrupt. So um, we, no. have, we have we have we have <laughs> I've known you long enough I to know, say you, no to you that. You can say no. <laughs> All these other people in the room know me. Ian doesn't, Ian doesn't put up with my crap. So, Ian, you know what be really helpful? Um, we have a largely North American yeah. audience here. It's kind of late European time. So it would be really helpful to talk about how important the Bund yield is and the JGB yield is. So you look at the big creditor countries and how – you know, what's going on with the yen and yield curve control and the JGBs and – so you're, it's a really important thing, and we've been trying to emphasize this to institutional investors as well, George, is that don't just look at that downtrend in the 10-year in the, 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 the and the 30-year as though it's all about America. Particularly in the last you know, four or five years, that gravitational pull of zero rates from the ECB, from the BOJ, has been absolutely critical. So you know, until you think that the BOJ and the ECB – are going to change their spots and we're going to have a new regime there, you're not going to get a new regime in global bond markets. And we just don't think that that's happening, you know, that we're still seeing that commitment, you know, from the, the BOJ to keep those bond deals under control. And you know, we had Lagarde yesterday saying that she was going to wait to raise rates until after the end of the asset purchase programs. So, you know, she's in no hurry. You know, this is the, the framework of the last 10 years is still in place. I was hoping there was going to be a different kind of world. But, you know, we're still seeing, you know, fiscal tightening around the world and monetary tightening. You've got monetary tightening and fiscal tightening into a global slowdown. You know, what do we think we're going to get here? Do we think we're going to see bond yields go to, to 4%, 5%? You know, no, we're, we're triggering a global slowdown. And every financing, you know, liquidity-driven rally has been ended by, you know, tighter rates and a risk that somebody ends up blowing up, you know. And, you know, this isn't going to be different. You know, right. every so, every dollar cry, right. every time we've had so, dollars so, going so, up. So, so we, we, we've talked about this a lot in the rooms, and I see we've got our usual smart cookies have their hands raised. we got Gaia and, and Cantro, um, and we're going to get to them in a minute. But the idea that 
rates go up, the Fed tightens until something breaks. I mean, that's sort of like truth that we hold to be self-evident in this from. Really, the question has been like how far, do, how high do rates have to go? John Roke, who's not in here today, had the chart that broke Twitter two weeks ago. We showed over the, over the last 40 years. I'll, I'll put up the chart. Uh, maybe someone can put it up. You have a series in of, of higher, of lower highs and lower lows. Each success. This is over three or four yep. decades. Yep. But now what's happened, it looks like the, the, the higher, we've actually had a higher high, not a lower high. So the question is, have we, did we just hit the level at which, you know, the economy breaks or, or, and I'm going to throw out a different concept to you if I may, but I'm going to put the guy amongst the pigeons. The idea that uh, the private sector is in relatively better shape than it's been in past cycles, that the debt accumulation has really occurred in the public sector. It's been the governments that have been borrowing all the money. And as we know, it's an economic identity. The public sector deficit is the private sector surplus. And so that, yes, yeah, something will break. But for instance, if you look at the debt uh, service ratio for individuals in the U.S., I don't have the numbers for elsewhere. It's actually relatively healthy right now. Um, if you look at corporate balance sheets, relatively healthy. Spreads have started to deteriorate the last few days, but you know, as of a week ago, there was nothing to see. You looked at, at, at yield spreads, and Bobby J, who's, who's forgotten more about credit than we'll ever know, he's talked about it in this room. The smoke detectors have kind of started to go off a little bit, but nothing really terrible. So I guess the question I put to you, Ian, yes, yeah, something will break. But the question is, because of the nature of this cycle, again, history rise doesn't repeat itself, because the debt accumulation has been in the public sector balance sheet, not the private sector balance sheet, does that make you think that the level at which rates have to go to to break something might actually be higher than it would be otherwise? No, I don't think so, George. Because oh, I thought a, that was a really switched on no, question. I, that's a, you know, I, it is a switched on question, it's an, and it's a question, and it's a pushback that we're hearing from a lot of people. Really? But, you know, one of the things that you, you know, not that many people. But <laughs> okay. I was really impressed with my question. <laughs> but, you know. It, you know, one of the problems that we, we see is an over-reliance on the idea that interest rates drive absolutely everything. And, you know, so uh, you know me from a long time ago. Sure. I was doing economic forecasting at the right. Bank of England right. in the 1980s. And, you know, we all thought that it was actually about interest rates. The Bank of England model and the American housing market as well are driven by rates of change of real personal disposable income. You know, in the bank model in the 1980s, and it's only got worse since then, you know, real personal disposable income had a, was three times as powerful as interest rate changes. The fact is so, that so, the, so rates have changed in real disposable income. Absolutely. And so that rise in inflation at the time that earnings have been OK, but not, you know, not rip roaring. The three year rate of change of U.S. real personal disposable income is negative today. And that tells you in the past, you know, we've got a lovely chart of it that when, you know, that that is going to lead house prices lower. So I worry that what we've got is that, yeah, they, that, that it looks as though the debt position is better, but that can turn around very, very quickly. And, you know, that people are using debt you know, because we've actually seen some of those consumer debt numbers go up very sharply. People are trying to hold to their 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 consumption patterns and they're just going to get them in themselves in problem because they aren't used to the fact that rates go up. They're used to the fact that rates stop. At so, yeah, so Ian, recently, um, and I think we're going to have uh, Cantrell and Michael Guy speak to this. Some of the recent credit card data coming out of the states, it showed, you know, useful uplift in the spending numbers. But when you strip out the inflation, it shows a different picture. And yeah. Bobby J will talk about this later. He's done some consulting comp- consulting arrangements with a couple of big consumer companies. And he's spoken about how some of these consumer companies are actually seeing um, pushback on price, unit unit declines, because people are having to spend more. And, and so, but so, so, you know, retail sales might be up X in nominal terms, but they're down Y in real terms. And, and, for, and for equity so, investors, real earnings matter. And that's going to be one of the big issues here. So yeah, you're absolutely right, George. Those real consumption numbers are starting to come down. Inflation adjusted. Yeah. And let me just add one other point, give you a chance to catch your breath. Um, I was speaking with a friend who uh, is is in private equity and they own a bunch of uh, uh, consumer products companies. I'm not going to mention the names, but it, it, these are consumer product. This is a durable consumer durable that you know is something like a Weber grill or a KitchenAid refrigerator or you know Sub Zero, and the sort of thing that 
you know, business went through the roof when we had the pandemic because there was a huge switch in consumer spending from services to goods. So predictably, their earnings, you know, their demand went through the roof. Their earnings went through the roof. Raised prices. Inventories got depleted. So they start this company. Let's call it just Hartnett Consumer uh, Hartnett Consumer Goods. They started building more inventory, building working capital, getting raw mat- more raw materials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because they couldn't keep up with the demand. And they've actually built inventory now to like two or three times the level where it was a couple of years ago. And guess what's happened in the last few weeks, couple of months? Orders are collapsing. So, and then, and then a friend of mine who was um, just went shopping, um, came to visit uh, in the New York City, the Westchester area. He went shopping just for fun to local Bloomingdale's. And there were some items like kitchen. I can't remember what the, what the names were. Things which are never on sale, guess what? $100 off. So it would seem that we might have an inventory problem here right now. And, and earnings earnings could be jeopardized. And, 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 and so I hear what you're, what you're saying. I, I actually wonder, because you know me, I always go off half cock with these crazy scenarios. We're, it, we're, with the decline in corporate earnings, could just be ginormous. Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, what you've just described is what economists call a bullwhip effect. Yes. So, you know, a lot of a lot, yep, of, exactly. a lot of uh, a lot of your listeners will have heard about that or read about that. But but what you've described is just a real example of all with this effect. But it's not just earnings. That's what brings down prices. So you just talked about price discount. Right. That is about inflation coming down. And yet the expectation that these bond yields are going to go higher and higher and higher. You know, that's the challenge that you're going to face that inventory overhang and the demand slow. So, so Ian, let me challenge you. I mean, by the way, I know. Um, Many of you love these rooms, and I like to say this is really excellent Ian, that we're doing this live, person to person, face to face. I often say this is sort of like a hot. It's, it's, it, I think what people appreciate has been at this long enough. I know the questions to ask, so it sort of emulates a buy side, a high level buy side investment strategy conversation. This is exactly the type of dialogue that Ian would have if there weren't 900 people listening. Just push the ball back and forth, trying to figure out what's going on here. Um, so, Ian, so that's all true, but at the same time, the Fed can't produce more oil. The Fed can't grow more wheat. So what if we just get a situation where, yeah, I get it. The price of the Queezian art goes down or the price of the Sub-Zero goes down, but it doesn't tell, inform me at all about what's going to be the price of oil the price of wheat. I mean, that's sort of price inelastic. So what if we get a situation where the price of those things keeps going up? And completely eviscerates real real consumer income. So if they keep on going up, that is certainly true. But what you're actually seeing in something like the oil market is that the EIA, the, you know, the Energy uh, International Energy Authority, you know, they they have you know uh, forecast for things like inventories. You know, we've got a lovely chart that inverts the inventory level and the forecast of those inventories, and you know the Brent crude price uh, or WTI price. And they could get their forecast for inventories 50% wrong and the rise in inventory, the levels. And you've seen things like, you know, the attempt to get the Iranians back in the market. You know, we're going to see that big up. We know the OEC, the, the, the OPEC members, you know, don't always stick to their quotas. Um, those inventories will start to rise again, if particularly if economic demand starts to slow globally and oil prices will come down. The food prices, you know, now that's where Ukraine has a bigger impact because we've argued that Ukraine will go potentially, the longer it goes on, it becomes, it shifts from being a a, a regional uh, energy crisis to being more of a global food crisis. But, you know, at the same time, the dollar holds down the global price of, you know, these internationally traded goods, George. So, you know, that's the, particularly for U.S. investors, uh, for U.S. consumers. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to interrupt here, Ian. Um, Please feel so, free. So, yeah, so I'm getting some back channel messages here. Um, I'm not going to say this fellow's name, but I'll just tell you his message. He says, hi, George. Have have contacts who sell clothing to the majority of big retail chains like Walmart and Gap and Ross and TJX. And what you're saying is spot on. Sales in the U.S. for retail have totally fallen off the cliff. Orders have been cut back. Inventory levels are high. But the really interesting thing is, guess what sector I want to buy? What's that? Retail. 
Really? Why yeah. is that? Because the prices have been slammed? No, because retail sector always holds up better than the rest of the market when economic growth slows. So the big misconception is that because it's about a retail slowdown, you want to avoid retail completely. But when there's an economic slowdown, the big delta in economic growth, the big delta in earnings isn't in retail because still consumption is 70 to 80 percent of the of the of the economy. The big delta is always found in investment, in inventories and in trade. And so it's that cyclical bit of the economy, the industrials, the autos, the chemical companies. Those are the things you want to sell. And this time financial services as well, George. It's not retail. It's not utilities. It's not healthcare because they're actually going to get the benefit from when these bond yields come down in response to that economic slowdown. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't think they're necessarily going to go up a lot, but they're going to go down a lot less than so, some of these other areas okay, in the market. Okay, so Ian, we're talking about the economy and we're talking about the market. Those, yep. those are two different things. But, okay? but George, oh, hold on, hold on, you hold know on. me. You know, I know, I know, 30 years I've been a strategist you know, I, who I, uses I, economics. I understand. I understand. I said So it, it's like the idea of having two opposing views in your head at one time and not going nuts. Yeah. Okay, fine. So we get your views in the economy. Um, but, but let's now do the, 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 the read across for what it means for markets. These are two different yeah. things. So could you speak to markets? OK, so when we think about the markets, the, the starting point is the valuations. Now, clearly, equities are cheaper than they were. But how cheap? You know, it, relative to 10 year PEs, trailing PEs, you're still only down 15 percent or something like that. Buying levels are significantly lower. The chart I've been sharing with clients this year is the, the long run Schiller PE chart, which I'm sure, you know, all your all of your listeners will have, have seen already. We are still at PEs on that Schiller basis. So that detrended 10 year earnings growth number uh, that are above 1929. Equity wait, wait, above 1929. Schiller PEs are still above where they were in 1929 and not very much lower than where they were in 2000. You know, equities are still expensive. But, you know, Relative to bonds, they had been relatively cheap when you're looking in a yield basis. Right. But that's the thing that's really changed now. So so aren't, aren't equities expensive relative to the bonds right now? They are now getting expensive relative to bonds. So that's why I would much rather be out of equities, into bonds, you know, within the equity space. You know, the things that you want to avoid are, you know, I don't like this this focus on value versus growth. Right. I'm an old fashioned guy, sure. you know, as you know. You've got gray hair, I've got no hair. <laughs> um, this is about cyclicality versus defensiveness. That's a much more consistent relationship over history. And those cyclicals are still, even though, again, we've got a, a 70 year chart or 50 year chart, you know, cyclicals have only just started to roll over the top. People say, oh, but they're down a long way. Cyclicals look cheap, relative def defensive, George. But, you know, they've hardly come off at all. And when you look at the valuations of those cyclicals, we look at, say, something like price to book, because that's the most, you know, defensive. Yeah, measure. I have to stop you. I'm sorry, I'm not going to name names. But I got into a little bit of a tiff the other day. I mentioned price to book to somebody. This is one of these investors <laughs> that's only been around post GFC. Yeah. And they're like, what's that? What's that? Okay. So so the idea that profitabilities mean reverting. I mean, it's just, I want to shoot myself in the head. So, so those kind of really defensive valuations like price to book and dividend yield, you know, although you can draw these lovely charts, and I know some of our competitors, uh, you know, at the, the investment banks rather than the independents uh, are actually doing this. You know, they, cyclicals look cheap relative to some of those defensives. But in absolute terms, if you look at those relative to the low points of cyclical downturns in the last 10, 15, 20 years. So even that post GFC period, you've got a long, long way for these valuations in cyclicals to come down. So that's why I still, you know really dislike things like autos, chemicals. And if inflation break evens come down, that's another great indicator for sector strategy, regional strategy. You want to be in places like the US, not Eurozone. You want to be in places like, you know, healthcare and utilities, not autos, chemicals and the basic resources. So Ian, Ian just between you and me. 
I have a friend. I, I have a friend. He's short. Dark. Okay. <laughs> What should I tell him? He hates Kathy Wood. And he thinks those those those, those prices. I, I don't know. Is is it, is it bollocks? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the to, word you use. I hate use. to tell you. What should I tell my I friend? I hate to tell you that you know if we move into that world where economic growth is slowing, and um, inflation's coming down, then those technologies, some of those technology plays are going to come back into fo- into focus. I'd rather play alternative energy because I think that that is a much better structural right. story. Right. But. You know, what we find is that that you want to be in, if you want to be in tech, you have to be in tech software, not tech hardware. In an economic downturn, it's going to be um, a world where hardware is coming under pressure relative to software. Right. So, you know, it depends what ARC invests in from here. Sure. But what you don't want to do, you know, it's going to be a more liquidity constrained world, but it's going to be a slower economic growth world. So the cyclical bits of tech will still get, you know, completely crunched right. the more defensive bits are you know going to be in a, a, a problem that's great so ian uh should we take some questions now yeah that's sounds great. like a good idea so i'd like to george let me to, hold on hold on and, and by the way okay. bobby j um just so you know i'm gonna assume that i'm still having problems bringing people up so i'm gonna i'm gonna task yourself and gnostic with bringing people up i can't do it so um, I'm still screwed up. Bobby J, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to, uh, I want to back up Ian here because I think there's the potential, Ian, for five-year strips, U.S., to uh, return 10% from here. And two things that are happening that people aren't paying attention. Number one, the curve has steepened by 60 basis points over the last three weeks. Yep. We were we were flirting with an inverted curve, and lo and behold, it turns around and it steepens. Uh, number two, I'm going to say three things. Number two, I'm completely with you on the tightening that is occurring uh, because real income is declining. And number three, if we get mortgage rates up another 50 basis points from here, and part of that might happen when the Fed sells mortgages. We are going to have the worst housing affordability in this country since 1986. That's yeah. it. Yeah. You know, and, and those, those are, you know, key points. And you know, I, th- I think that's the reason why I really don't think that this, this stagflation issue, you know, is, is going to come through. Because, you know, in a stagflation world, you know, rates have to go... 100 basis points, Fed funds rate typically goes 100 basis points through, you know, where we are on on 30 year, let alone that five year level. Uh, you know, so that, 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 that you know, I, you know, I, I think that the concerns that people have um, about just how committed the Fed will be, because remember that, you know, they can carry on raising rates, but if they do, they are just going to exacerbate their, their, their problems and that they're going to have to choose at that point between creating a financial crisis or an inflation crisis. Um, and, you know, I think at that point they will be forced to cut. But our model suggests that you'll actually see the rest of the world start to stabilize their interest rates and cut rates before, you know, potentially the Fed needs to as well. That's great. Um, all right. So, Bobby J, you're driving the bus in terms of bringing people up because I, I can't get people up here. So let's go first to Michael Gaia, and then we go to Michael uh, Kantrowitz. Michael Gaia, just so you know, um, we went through this discussion the other day. You weren't in the room, but it turns out in Hebrew, Michael means king. So King Michael Gaia, the floor is yours. Welcome, Michael. I thought it meant gift from God, which uh, I don't no, know. So, if I, yeah, something, something like that. Along Whatever. Go on. Yeah. yeah okay. So, so by the way, so Ian, I um, I I rarely do the clap my hands thing because I think it's kind of silly on spaces, but. I was doing it all throughout your little um, speech there because so much of what you said, I totally agree with. So a couple things. First of all, just a little bit of background. So I'm a portfolio manager, run a mutual fund and two ETFs. All of my funds require treasuries to act as the risk off safe haven asset. Yeah. Which tells you right away that this, as I've been saying very publicly, has been a hellish environment for the world that I live in from a risk on risk off perspective. Because when your opportunity set is all acting the same way. Treasury sell off, equity sell off. You can't really do anything no. except take it, right? And all of the work that I've done that my funds are based on, their quantitative nature, 
It's not my opinion. I wrote papers around them. Utilities are a predict- predictive indicator of stock market collapses. Lumber to gold is. It hasn't been this year. So I've been going through hell. My Roto ETF in particular has gotten brutalized because, again, nothing's working. Now, I've said many times the last several months here that inflationary shocks are inherently deflationary because the speed with which yields have risen, the speed with which the cost of goods has increased, ultimately is going to cause that slowdown, ultimately is going to result in a deflation pulse returning, which means yield should fall in the long end. All the stock market rising rates ends up slowing down because the stock market ends up breaking inflation faster than the Fed. So if we go with that, that notion and that narrative, I am curious your thoughts on the sequence of returns here. Because I think the issue that a lot of people have is all this sounds good, but the reality is the way it plays out between the endpoints, that dance is all that matters in terms of not just investor returns, but investor behavior. Do you think, Ian, that we are at a juncture where you could have very suddenly a surprise rally back in everything, just as the everything bubble seems to be bursting? The sentiment is so dark that you could have a face ripper rally in everything before ultimately lower lows. That's sort of more my thesis, yeah. but, but I'm curious. But, but I want you to talk in that sequence of returns because, listen, we can, we, you can all be right about commodities being higher a year from now. They can still go down 10, 15, 20 percent in the next month and a half. Yeah, so I, I, I think the um, you know there's a, there's a, there were a lot of things uh, within that. So thank you very much indeed. So I think the, the the starting point is the you know the correlation between bonds and equities. You know, correlation between bonds and equities will go positive rather than the current inverted, which your fund is based on. You know, right, no, sorry, but, and, and, but, and just just distinguish between. So, bonds with credit risk versus treasuries, because even though yeah, treasuries yeah, bonds, yeah, yeah. Right, it's different so, behavior. Convention. So I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about treasuries there, but it's um you know that that's you know we're not anywhere we aren't seeing that you know and you know it's not enough for it to happen for a day and a half, which is what we've seen recently. You know, in looking back over history, you know that 1980s 90s period, you saw very strong positive correlations sustained for a very long time. <laughs> Now, you know, the world that we're talking about here, where we start to see, um, you know, equity prices coming down. And I think, you know, in terms of sequencing, that is what we will see. Um, equity prices coming down first. You know, then we start to see commodity prices coming down. And so that's why I was cheering that big decline in, in commodity prices today. And then we start to see the bond returns going up. And that's where we go back to this inverse inverse correlation between um, equities and bonds. Right. So, during, during those high stress periods, in other words. Yeah. So, right. you know, I think the, the, the one trouble is that, you know, as we know, the only thing that goes up in a bear market or, or, a, uh, or a recession is actually correlation. So, you know, that's going to be one thing that takes out everybody and concerns everybody. But, you know, for, for now, I think what we would be just emphasizing is we just you know, want to make sure that people keep very risk averse, you know, whatever their framework is, whatever their funds are, you know, we just need to be looking at a very risk averse environment so that you can actually, um, you know, uh, try and make sure you've got some cash on hand so that you can take advantage of these market bottoms. But um, I think the last comment on that is, and one reason why I'm still bearish, um, is that Equities haven't actually really massively underperformed bonds in the last three months. So, 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 Ian, um, I want to bring Michael Kantrowitz into this conversation because I think you, 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 you are soulmates. And but have equities? Michael K has been talking about just the derating we've seen from in equities. PEs have contracted as bond yields have gone up, but there's been no um, nothing in the price for perhaps a slower economy or recession and weaker earnings. So, you know, I just want to understand something. Whereas the sort of the sort of stockbroker economics view, the sound bite talking as on CNBC is, oh, good, you know, breathlessly, interest rates are peaking, bond yields are peaking. So it's the all clear sign we can go buy stocks. Okay, you're, you're saying no. And you explain no. why you're saying no. So, you know, I think, you know, watch out because sentiment, you know, is, uh, you know, it is oversold, as, you know, Tommy was sort of saying at the beginning. 
you know, our work suggests that you could see a, a rally of five to seven percent, you know, in, you, in the next 40 days when you get this kind of level of oversold sentiment. But, you know, the problem is that until the real economy starts to stabilize and that requires either fiscal easing or monetary easing, um, you know, what we saw in 2000 to 2003, what we saw in 2006, 2007, going into 2009, you know, is that, you know, you get these four storms and you keep on seeing equities coming under pressure. Um, and, you know, you then need to see somebody coming in and creating liquidity. The most likely place at the moment would be China. But, you know, at the moment, you know, what we're hearing is that the Chinese authorities still want to keep the credit to GDP ratio flat. And that means that any kind of credit support is going to be very limited. It's going to have to be on the fiscal side. I don't think that's enough for what they're facing. Got it. Now, okay. Ian, real quick, can I ask a question about that? Real quick. Yeah. How, does, how does the dollar factor into that? Because if the dollar, I mean, to me, it looks like a blow off top. Maybe I'm wrong. OK, but if the dollar were to start reversing, that could be a way of reliquifying things. Yeah. So uh, you're absolutely right, Michael. I, you know, I view I view the dollar as a real time global liquidity indicator, you know, but our macro models, um, you know, work on the basis that if the U.S. economy is growing faster than the global economy, then the dollar still goes up. So what we actually really need to see is that the, the rest of the world. So it's not just enough to see China start to recover, but you actually need to see you know, areas like Eurozone um, and Japan recover as well. They need to start recovering whilst the U.S. is still, you know, struggling a little bit. And that will be the dollar coming down. So, you know, if we saw loose money and loose fiscal, the dollar would come down and I'd be super bullish. And until that dollar starts to, to, to come down. But as I say, the macro conditions aren't in place. Real interest rate differentials. They're not uh, they're not pointing to that. See, Ian, if I just drill down that a little bit, um, you know, people talk about needs to tighten financial conditions and therefore that'll be a way of slowing the economy. But the trade-off between growth and inflation, um, and growth growth and interest rates, and we had, went through this period, multi-year period of the great moderation. We had, we, we had disinflation, if not deflation. And so we had higher growth, but inflation wasn't really an issue. Yeah. And so the correlations, and put your Bank of England economist back hat, hat back on, just because we had higher growth didn't mean we had higher inflation, nope. right? Okay. So now, just when we get slower growth, yeah, inflation will come down, but might it still be uncomfortably high enough so that we don't get the real ease in liquidity conditions, and therefore, and therefore, the multiple expansion when people, you know, that you normally might expect, it's like, okay, fine, I get bond yields have to go down, but you're not going to get the multiple expansion because because you need to have. Tidal liquidity conditions. So, still. so George, you're you're absolutely right. You know, so some people tend to rely on GDP when they're looking about multiple expansion. Some people tend to look at inflation or bond yields. The work that I've done, you know, dating back to the mid 1990s, is that it's actually how many units of growth can you generate for every unit of inflation, that is PE multiples. You know, that that is the key driver of changes in PE multiples. So. You know, if we're in a world where economic growth, where economic growth picks up, but inflation picks up faster, then you're going to be in trouble. You know, you need a world where inflation is moderating and economic activity is picking up to get higher multiples. I think in the next decade, then we are going to see higher inflation trend and, you know, an, an economic activity that's probably not that different from what we've had before. And that's going to be why. You know, longer term, we see um, uh, markets come under pressure. But remember, one of the structure, the things that we would say here is that the structural is always overcome by the cyclical. As investors, it always sounds really seductive and sexy to talk about the structural stories. But as investors, it's the cyclical and entry and exit points for the cyclical bits that are absolutely crucial. That's great. So um, I just like to take a break for just. Uh... 60 seconds. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Um, so why don't we, let me just take a break right here, and, and this is great. We're speaking with Ian Harnett of our ASR. We had uh, Tom Thornton initially in the room giving his technical update on what's going on. Um, we're not at the bottom yet, and here's his view on a very short-term basis. Ian talking, speaking about how he thinks 
bond yields may be peaking right now and that uh, we're looking at a, a big economic slowdown and declining earnings. And that's really the basis for his negative view on markets. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn to Michael uh, Kantrowitz. Michael, it might be useful. I, th I think you and, 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 and Ian have reasonably, your views are in alignment. So maybe you could just weigh in with your two cents on what you think is going on, what, what, what part of uh, Ian's views you agree with, disagree with, because I, I, I think you guys really are soulmates. So, Michael K., good yeah. to see you. The floor is yours. Hey, hey, George, and hey, Ian. Um, you know, before you said that, George, I was listening to Ian. I'm just like, man, this guy's like my long-lost twin. Um, I, I can't really think of much that I disagree with. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, you know, the, the consumer call, uh, which I'm assuming is a relative call, uh, I have some questions about uh, that. Uh, my, my, Michael K., okay, just hold on one second, please. Just yeah. hold on one second. We're actually, yeah. this is running on. We're actually having to order dinner here. We're, uh, we're sitting in, for those of you who care, we're 200 uh, Vesey Street, right across from Goldman Sachs. So um, we're actually going to run this room through our dinner. So Ian's just ordering dinner right now. Stand by. Okay, so Michael K., the floor is yours again. Ian is ready for your questions. Go ahead, Michael K. All right, so I, I wanted to ask Ian, when you're looking at um, your models in terms of how, when's the economy going to bottom? There we go. What's a simple question? What do your models say about that? that that's that's a very simple question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, George, George is still ordering his uh, his, his supper, but uh, um, you know. So, what do our models say? You know, I think that what we point to is that you know the risk is that you'll get um, a really quite sharp slowdown going into 2023, and that that it it probably won't be until the middle of 2023. Um, you know that you see the bottom here. You know, one of the issues. Mike... Wait, wait, stop, 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 <laughs> stop. K, Michael K, did you pay? Did you freaking pay Harnett to say that? I, oh my, it's it's, 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 it's it's like this is this is scary. Just so you know, you, you would know this. He's been saying we don't get the turn until sometime later in twenty three. I don't know if you guys are using the same model or maybe Michael K. Well, you just stole the Bank of England's model. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, but, but you know, I think the you know. So if we if we're on, in alignment, then Michael, you know, the question is what could go wrong with that view. So you know, what would extend the cycle, and you know, what would you know, shorten the cycle. So you know, the, the the thing that for me that you know would extend the cycle is you know very much a you know a, a situation where we saw housing you know the housing bust prolonged, um, and you know where we saw. Um, fiscal policy, you know, still remaining very contractionary. So we saw politics overtake the, um, you know, the the the, the economics. Um, and, or the thing that would reverse it would probably have to be, as I say, it's probably China. You know, one of the models that we have is that you can explain something like, you know, almost seventy percent of the uh, global equity returns for for the last ten years. Um, looking at you know the acceleration and deceleration of Chinese economic activity, my business partner and uh, and colleague that uh, George was talking about, David Bowers, he loves to talk about global um, global geopolitics um, or even things like midterms. But you know, in truth, it's going to be what uh, what China does to reflate that could be more of an important determinant as to how quickly economic growth uh, recovers. And at the moment, there's no sign that the Chinese are really going to pump prime um, at this stage. Michael, do you have All another right. question? Just yeah, quick follow-up. So, uh, on on the market in general, what do you think could be the catalyst that puts in a, a, a bottom, or or you know, of all the things, right? We got rates, inflation, commodities, the economy. It what, you know, what, for, for you me, pick it, one. It, it tends to be all of the above. So you know, what I want to see is our valuation models, um, you know, looking cheap relative to the previous three years. Uh, the bond equity yield ratio being cheap as well, um, and signs that the economy is starting to stabilize. But more importantly, what you've seen at, at major bottoms in the past, I would argue, and particularly in something like the GFC um, and also with the pandemic, is you have to see policy action. So in the GFC, it was the creation of the G20 um, that was announced in early March 2009. And in the pandemic, it was the Fed stepping in to stabilize the credit market. And I think that's, you know, that credit market is absolutely critical because we are already starting to see emerging market defaults. People that have borrowed in dollars are starting to struggle here. Um, and, you know, the credit market will follow. And 
but remember that, that what we've had is that the, the Fed is determined to sustain the credit market, not the equity market. So I think the, the equity market put is no more. The credit market put is actually the thing that could save you. So, Ian, just translate that since most people in this room are equity investors and thinking about, again, we know race or rise to something breaks. So and, and so the, the change in correlations between credit and equities and, and how the strike price maybe higher or lower. So I'm not getting into picks and what's the market going to do tomorrow, but sort of just sitting here right now, as you sit here today, what is it, if you did the wing and put your finger in the air, like how much downside do you think there are on global equity markets right now? So I, I you know, I think let's just look at, you know, simply at the S&P. I, you know, the, the fact that we saw the S&P rise very gently for, you know, the last year or so, you know, if you if we break, if we sustain this this low below four thousand, you know, I think the next stop is something like three thousand five hundred. That would be, as you folks would say, a useful decline. I believe. That would be a that would be a useful decline. Yes, yes George. Yes. And it would it would chase out quite a lot of the margin, the, the margin buyers. You know, it, I'm afraid it would okay. chase out. All right, just for everybody in the room who didn't understand him. He said useful decline. That means short the fuck out of it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Let's go to some Michael K. Is another question, or we want you to stay up there? I'm sure. I'm sure there'll be other questions. Not financial Michael advice, K. by the way, George. Not financial advice. Just exactly, exactly. <laughs> and the, the difference is, you work for real firms. So you have to be careful what you say. I'm a kind of wild animal, and so people are afraid of me. Yeah, three, no, fair enough. All right, so so all right, so three aces. My good friend, three aces. We're going to go to you, and then we're going to go to Aaron. Three aces. What's up, man? Hey, my brother. How are you, um, Ian? Very, yes. very nice. Very, very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you. This is always yeah. gonna, it's always worrying when people are complimentary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I posted in the nest. I've been posting this for nine months, the business cycle. <laughs> and to hear you talk about it, I mean, you know, you know, it's just fabulous. And because you actually just outlined it perfectly. So I'm I'm a, I'm not in the financial markets right professionally anymore. I'm I'm in the I'm on Main Street. And, um, you know, when the thing that fascinated me the most about what you said was the cyclicality, the cycle will always overtake the structure. And my question, if there is one in here, I'll find it, I promise you, um, (laughs) (laughs) um, is that, you know, having lived through two distinct, horrific business cycle downturns in the past decade or so um, on the prize as, as you know, owning my own company, um, but watching the financial markets structure shrug it off because of, you know, you know, the, the you know, the Dr. Frankenstein tactics of the Fed and, and the fiscal and monetary policy. I'm just curious now that things seem to be, you sobering up a bit from this, you know, intoxication, if you will. Um, when the business cycle does come back, if and when, does this same market structure just pick up and left and take it, you know, where, where you know, pick it up from where it left off? Because, you know, we have $9 trillion that was, you know, basically handed out like with drunken sailors in one year. You know, and if, yeah. if that didn't happen personally, I think the stock markets would absolutely have collapsed by now yeah. to, to watch these things trade the garbage that they are. Much of it, you know, this unprofitable tech sector still trading this much liquidity at every single price all the way down is unbelievable to me. <clears throat> so it tells me that monster is still alive in there someplace. So I guess my question would be when the cycle turns again. Can we expect the same structure to carry it, or will that have been completely changed uh, at that time? Uh, I understand it's impossible to answer, right? Yeah, I think that's <laughs> realistically. It's a, right. you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. No, I think you know that's a, you know. So let's let's tackle that in two two ways. First of all, I think you're absolutely right about you know the 
the, the role of these new structures that are being created. And one of the things that we are most nervous of here is that normally in a, in a downturn, you'd want to be short banks. But this time, you know, it's probably going to be financial services com com companies more generally, particularly these new fintech companies that have got business models that haven't been tested, that rely on wholesale funding that hasn't been tested by higher rates. You know, it's those kind of things that, you know, particularly if they've used AI uh, technology to look at the default rates that they are, you know, uh, uh, you know, using, and they might have had daily data for the last 15 years, but that's not going to be enough to protect them in this kind of world. So, you know, we would be very concerned that you will actually see some financial service sector failures here. Um, and that will probably be one of the things that prompts the Fed to step in at some stage. So, you know, the downside is there. The, you know, the, uh, the margin debt investors are being uh, exposed by every 3% day down, down day and margin calls get taken. So the bad news about that is that people have to, to stabilize uh, their margins by selling liquid things that haven't gone down yet. Um, what comes out of the other side? Well, it partly depends what kind of um, response we see from policymakers. Uh, I do think policymakers are afraid of a wholesale clear out. I think, you know, the concern about both Main Street and Wall Street is there from policymakers. So I think that they will find it very difficult to wean themselves off the whole QE drug. So I think at the moment, our suspicion would be that you might actually see, you know, a return to something like QE. And, you know, it will once again be, you know, some of these similar structures uh, that could hold up well. But as we, the thing that will be different in the next cycle, we suspect, is that you will actually see more fiscal activism and you will see loose money and loose fiscal being deployed at the same time as it was in the 1950s, as it was in the 1960s. So break in, Ian, break in. So this POS piece of, you know what, called Upstart. Right, it's I obviously can't comment on any of these individual okay. stock I know, I, I know I, absolutely nothing I know about it's, them, it's George. Not an investor, it's even <laughs> Upstart, which is one of these things, buy now, pay later pieces of crap. I'm not even sure what it does. <laughs> exactly what you were saying. Down 40% after hours. The stock has gone from 401 to 48, down 88%. That's quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that a useful decline? That's a useful decline. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's not a decline that you want to take advantage of. So one of the things that we would say is that, that bu um, bubbles we define as periods where you've got exponential growth in any asset. Exponential, dude. Get with the – bro, it's exponential. That's uh, your patty and, line must and, have and you know that it's bust when you've lost 80% of the value. <laughs> That's when, as you know, George, you have the tricky decision because it's at that point where it's double or bust. Right. And as you know, Ian – What's the definition of a stock that went down 90%? <laughs> it's down 80 that gets cut in half yeah. again. So there yeah. you go. And, and some of them will be like that. You, know, it, they're, 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 you will get wiped out. But you know, that's where we see the business models really being tested. And that's where you need the quality management. Um, you know, and Awesome. 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 All right. So let's move on. Thanks for that, Three Aces. Much appreciated. So let's go to uh, Aaron. Aaron, you're up. What's up, man? Hello, guys. This is Aaron Sapura. I'm an economist. And... Um, General editor of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I just wanted my quick input. It was just to congratulate. Um, Wait, is it Aaron? Did. Aaron? Aaron? I'm sorry, we can't hear Bob, Bobby J. Can you hear Aaron? I'm having a hard time hearing him. Can you hear me? No, I, he's he's choppy. Aaron, yeah, Aaron, you've got to make a big effort to speak into the phone and get into a good place because otherwise we can't hear you. We can't take the question. Okay, so DJ, what's going to hear me? I'll leave. No, it's very muffled. I'm sorry. Bobby J, can you please, um, yeah, and also other folks who want to uh, get up on stage, Bobby J, I can't bring any of them up, so you have to be directing traffic here. So w let's go to let's go to Steve H. Steve, good to see you. What's up, my friend? Steve, uh, H, Steve H, the floor is yours. Oh wow, <laughs> I I actually accidentally pressed the request button. I didn't actually mean to ask the question, but. Uh, uh, I do actually, I guess, uh, now that I have the opportunity to, first of all, say uh, 
very much appreciate this room and um, really it's quite an eye opener. I, I've got a PhD in economics in 2018 and honestly, uh, I've had to unlearn and relearn everything. <laughs> uh, well, that, 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 that's what we're here for, we're trying to deprogram people. Okay, so if you're learning, then we're doing something right. Keep going. Uh, and I, uh, what I do truly appreciate uh, is uh, the open-mindedness of this room that uh, obviously, George, uh, I was listening to one of your interviews earlier, uh, that you were basically feeling that this is a you know, time basically we're going to unwind about 30, well, 10 years of, of irresponsible liquidity and asset bubble, but not necessarily do serious damage to the main, the, the main economy, the real economy, such that you would just have a 2000 style.com uh, 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 you know, wash out, right? That's purely equity. And now we are hearing from Ian here and sounds like seconded by a few other, you know, analysts like Michael Kantrowitz here um, that uh, potentially we can actually have, a, a, you know, a, a deflationary sort of Balwick, you know, effect, you know, on the back end of this and uh, in, uh, major economy slowdown in, inviting policy intervention. Uh, it seems like uh, these are two pretty contrasting views, and and well, I mean, both 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 point towards equities getting absolutely destroyed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Steve, let, um, let me interrupt you for one second, okay? Heads equities lose, tails equities lose. It's like you know, Yogi Berra once said, "Come to the fork in the road, take it." All right. I mean, I keep saying people laugh at me, and by the way, I urge everyone a little sh shameless self promotion. Go watch the YouTube video today where. You know, people don't know what I look like much. Well, I was on steroids, on fire for an hour, going mental. Um, I, I did that. You, I did that uh, uh, podcast a week ago. So, on the one hand, you know, either you get, you know, this disinflationary recession that Ian and Michael K are talking about, which is not good for earnings and not good for equities, or, or if you know somehow the Fed blinks and they're, 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 maybe we're past the point, it doesn't even matter. Where you know Jerome Powell's unable to rediscover his Interpol Volker, and he, he's talking the talk, but he's not walking the walk. And you know the bond market kind of spit in his face last Thursday. You know, in the aftermath of the uh, Fed decision, initially people were all excited that it seemed like 75 basis points was off the table. That's kind of absurd that people would celebrate that, but whatever. If people get the idea that the Fed doesn't really have its heart in it, and I'll point out to you something right now: the Fed balance sheet hasn't. It's still growing. It's still growing. They're not, was it Ian? Like June, I think they're going to start to yeah. do something. Okay. So it's like, show me, you lo show me, you love me. Okay. It's like Jerome Powell has to have it both, wants to have it both ways. This idea, and Ian, there's going to be a question here. <laughs> yes. If, if, so my question so Steve, is, Steve, is, stop. is, no, hold on, hold on, Steve, yeah. hold on, hold on. You just got to a good question now. I just thought of this. So me and ask this question. Ian, without a recession, I mean, this idea that the talking head Goldilocks bubble people want to believe in, you know, the sort of smooth, glide post for the economy i mean you know i listen to henry Kaufman, who's still alive he's like 95 or Stephen roach who worked for arthur burns in the 60s the only way you get the, the i mean if you say you got a crunch economy you get to get inflation down you need a freaking recession all right and so the idea that and we still have you know the fed balance is still growing real rates are still very stimulative right so they 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 have to crush this thing there's no there's no easy way out of it because so, so okay so would you agree that goldilocks is dead the Goldilocks is going to be crunched because I define Goldilocks. We got to be careful. As, we're, as, we're, we're engaging in violence against um, women, but go ahead. No, 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 but you know the but that trade-off between growth and inflation will come down. What you know we refer to to that the the glide path you talk about as the immaculate deflation, uh, where you know it happens without any you know without yeah, any right. damage. Yeah, right. You know to to, to anybody. Um, you know, the, at the end of the day, you are going to have to create excess capacity. So, you know, even if you get the supply coming in, which is really the effort, the uh, you know, the basis of the of the the you know decline in inflation without too much prey, you know, you have to see demand coming down at the same time, and it's that gap that's the important thing. And that excess capacity, George, nearly always delivers a world where unemployment goes up. And the thing we've been flagging to people is that it's actually already starting to emerge in some of the sentiment data coming out of the NFIB. So the small and mid cap companies, employment expectations there are starting to moderate and the willingness to take on new labor is starting to moderate. Um, uh, so, you know, and the other thing is that those those um, 
those diesel prices, you know, they're also starting to squeeze truck sales. And, you know, that's another good in lead indicator of unemployment. So we're actually starting to see some signs that, you know, that rise in unemployment, you know, coming back to, to you know, the, the point, the speaker's point. Yeah, you know, I'm afraid the, you know, the economic growth um, is going to have to come down. Dinner just arrived, by the way. All right. So, uh, Michael K., I think you had a comment or reaction or question, Michael K. Uh, oh, sorry, Steve. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Just, just Steve, um, did you was your question answered? Was there a different point you'd like to well, raise? Well, it's, it's, it's sort of answered. But uh, if you know either Ian or Michael, maybe Michael can answer this. Is what are some of the couple of things that you would closely watch for to tell the two views here? Which one? is likely to be the one that actually emerges, you know, stagflation versus a just a straight up uh, uh, recession. So the, 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 you know, the thing that I would say, and the reason why I've been saying to clients that I don't think the, um, you know, the, we're in a stagflation world is that actually the bond market is not telling you that you're in a stagflation world. So, you know, bond markets, and so how do we define stagflation? So let's look at that first of all. I define stagflation as a world where, um, you know, the uh, where we're in recession. So I just use the NBER recession uh, indicator, um, and but in a world where inflation is rising on a trend basis. So I use the three-year trend CPI inflation. Periods of stagflation in the past have always seen the two-year yield go above the ten-year yield and the 30-year yield when the 10-year and the 30-year yield were going up. So, you know, the fact that the two-year yield has stabilized around this 260, 270 area, and yet we've still got, you know, the, um, uh, the you know, the 10-year te- the and the 30-year, you know, up at close to three, you know, that says to me that the, mo- the bond market is not telling you that you're in a stagflation world. Um, so that's my... I, I, I like to use the market to tell me because relying on economists is going to leave you, you know, three to six months <laughs> behind the uh, what's really going on. Right. So, Steve, does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Stephen. Thanks for that question. Appreciate it. Michael Kay, uh, your perspective, please. Um, sorry, I've been listening, listening in and out. Uh, the question about stagflation versus recession. Uh, I, I agree with Ian. You know, that, I mean, you're already seeing, again, Massive inventory buildups in certain areas. You got a rip roaring stronger dollar that will remain stronger and continue to be a disinflationary or deflationary force. Uh, and we've got the most tightening uh, in, in, in the way we look at the world. This is the most tightening we've ever seen cyclically. So if this well, Michael, isn't gonna, this isn't going to be dis, disinflationary, deflationary, I don't know what is. Yeah, well, Michael, let me ask you a question. Um, but George, can I, just, can I just add one one thing? To yeah, that? yeah, please Before, go ahead, go right. So ahead. real yeah. quick, I just want to make one more statement. Uh, this is something we talked about in earlier rooms. There was there's a new, just just to make why not make it a little more bearish. There's a an incremental new tightening cycle that just started, or it's we now know just started, uh, and that's banks. Banks lending standards is another governor of the cycle, and is now for commercial industrial loans negative, yeah. and the difference. Why this is a problem, and it's always a bad thing in a downturn, is that banks' lending standards, unlike the Fed, who eases when things get real ugly, banks do the opposite. They tighten up. They clench up because they don't want to let, lend anyone money who's not going to pay them back. So not only is are we in tightening territory, it's going to accelerate the more the economy weakens. Yeah. And you're, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. You know, a- absolutely right. And you know, we've got a lovely chart, a senior loan officer survey um, you know, data, and you get that every quarter, so you know the listeners can track that themselves. Um, and you know, when that's when that starts to rise and it, it's troughed, um, you know, then credit spreads start to go up. Availability of credit to companies starts to get squeezed, and that's really one of the big drivers of, of recession. Um, so yeah, I'd agree wholeheartedly. The other thing that that we would say is that you know, you need the, the you know the banks will start to come under pressure as well. And we've just started to see you know, the, the number of banks um, heading down into to more bearish territory equity prices. You know, that, that also tends to be the bottom. So, OK, that's great. So let's move on. Let's go to Gnostic and um, then we're going to go to Death Cross Capital Management. Gnostic, what's up, my friend? OK, I, I sent you a DM the other day with something that uh, Gordon Johnson put up. 
which was a chart of uh, multiple central banks currently withdrawing liquidity. Nearly four trillion has been removed from the system. Uh, I don't know if you can access that in the nest, uh, but I'd surely like to hear what the comments are on that one. Yeah, so um, I, thank you for the message. I was unable to respond to it. I think that just goes in the spirit of everything Michael Howell has been saying. I believe Michael Howell and Ian know each other. And Michael Howell's been big on the whole liquidity thing. And, you know, you have the Fed just staying with that, where the balance sheet's at nine and a half trillion or whatever. And they've spoken about wanting to reduce the balance sheet by three trillion. And napkin math on the way up, the idea was each hundred billion was about 40 S&P points. So all things being equal, which they never are, if you took the balance sheet down by three trillion, that'd be upwards of 1,200 S&P points. Larry Jetalo, who came out with a napkin math, was saying that actually the impact on the way down is likely to be larger due to less market liquidity. So it could be 50 S&P points for every 100 billion. So whether you're talking 1,200, uh, 1,500 uh, uh, S&P points. So Ian, a couple questions for you. Um, is this balance sheet thing, is it causality? Is it correlation? Hit number one. Number two. How likely is the Fed to be able to reduce its balance sheet by $3 trillion? Or is that just like a pipe dream? Someone's going to break well, well, well in advance. You know, I, you know, I think you know, we would say that, you know, balance sheet tightening, quantitative tightening is unambiguously a restrictive monetary policy. So, you know, it will squeeze the economy. So we, we were arguing that even prior to, to 2020, you know, the quantitative tightening that you were seeing at that stage was likely to trigger a major slowdown in 2020. Um, now, you know, clearly the pandemic accelerated that um, and the Fed reversed their QT very rapidly because of it. You know, I think the danger, George, is that we will see exactly the same, not a pandemic. <laughs> but as you say, if you if you and remember, Yellen said that quantitative tightening was supposed to be like watching paint drying. This is they were going to signal it. You know, so that, that, that it was because it was happening every every month and they told you in advance the market was going to respond to it and it was wasn't going to have an impact in the real economy. Guess what had an impact on the so real wait, economy? So wait, so let me get this straight. So it's like we're telling you Enron's going to go bankrupt. But since we know everyone's going to go, it's going to go bankrupt. There'll be nothing, no new news when it goes bankrupt. And therefore, don't worry. Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah, like and that. economists call it rational expectations. Oh, stop, stop, <laughs> stop, stop, stop. So in my Twitter rant this morning, I went on about, hey, you know, we had the rational bubble where, you know, it's 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 trading sardines. We all know it's overpriced, but it's a rational bubble because liquidity is going to keep flowing and it's expectation of higher prices. So it's a rational bubble. It's a bubble, but it's rational. So Ian, my friend, how about this being the rational bear market? Well, you know, I, I would argue as a macro strategist, nearly every bear market is a rational one because, you know, fundamentals matter here, George. You know, I know you believe it's all about positioning. Hey, bro, hey, bro, <laughs> uh, but, you know, value? Whoa, 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 whoa. so, you know, at the end of the day, you need those earnings and you need real economic growth um, to drive those earnings. And, you know, you need to have supportive liquidity at the same time to sustain bull markets. You know, if we're going into a world of tighter liquidity where earnings are disappointing, the downside risk for risk assets has got to be high. Um, so, yeah, quantitative tightening is, you know, it will be a way of getting inflation down. Remember that the Fed told us that, you know, net net wealth was and wealth effects were going to be positive. Um, you know, we're going to be playing a role in, in sustaining the economy in Q, when a QE world. When you go into QE, QT, that is deliberately targeting reduced wealth effects. So the Fed wants the stock market to go down. The Fed wants the stock market to come down. The Fed wants bonds to lose money. So, Ian, when you look at the um, the five things, and I had a couple of beers now, I'm not sure I can remember all of them, but the things that go with the financial conditions, the dollar, stock prices, short-term rates, bond yields, credit spreads. I think I got all of them, okay? What's the nail standing up that needs to be hammered down? Is it equity prices? I think it's going to be all of the above. As I say, you know, one of the things that, that's different this time, and I think how we will redefine monetary policy um, and perhaps financial conditions going forward, and remember that the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has already done this, is that the thing you missed out was house prices. 
And I think that, you know, that the importance of housing and shelter in the CPI means that the Fed know that they have got to get a handle on the house price inflation. So, you know, they're going to accept weaker house, uh, weaker equity prices, weaker um, wealth effects um, until house prices start to stabilize. So housing, I know, is top of mind for many people. We will, in the next couple of weeks, have the best housing analyst in America, Ivy Zellman, appear in this room. So we want to keep bringing the best of the best um, to help advance the conversation. And I have to now just pause for a minute, and as I always do, once again, put in the good word for a World Central Kitchen. They're doing God's work. I mean, just think about this, you know, in, in this room, we're not doing this for any personal financial gain. We're just a community here. We're trying to help each other. And I'm not doing this for any financial, personal financial benefit. And so if you find you're getting value from these rooms, I urge you to pay forward and give to World Central Kitchen. There are, you know, three and a half million refugees in the Ukraine. And these guys are going to areas that nobody else will go. They're literally being bombed on. We have in this room, we're dealing with a first world problem, trying to preserve or increase our net worth. Um, you know, the likes of Ian Harnett, Tom Thornton, Michael Kantrowitz, Michael Gayet. I mean, these people are, you know, top of their profession. And, um, you know, it costs many tens of thousands of dollars to, to get to listen to any one of these people. We're delivering value here for nothing, nothing. So... World Central Kitchen, we started this about a month ago, our, our pledge, our campaign. Our program, our, our, our pledge was to uh, hope was to raise $200,000. Last I checked before I started this room, we were up to about 125000 And I'm really, really thrilled that um, to just remind everyone, Alexander, who's in the room, he's, uh, I'm going to embarrass him, but I want to praise him and call him out. He's uh, in the third row over on the right. He came into the room last weekend, but nine days ago, and he is, puts his um, puts his money where his mouth is, and he challenged us with a fifty thousand dollar pledge, matching pledge, and um, to to if, if we raise fifty thousand, he would contribute fifty thousand, and so far I think what we've raised forty three of that fifty, so we're only seven thousand dollars away from hitting the fifty. And so that I believe we're about 124,000 before this room started. If we get up to 131, Alexander will happily donate 50,000, get us to 181, which will put us um, within striking distance of uh, our 200 goal. Um, I've, I've followed Alexander for a while. I've read about what he's doing for the uh, folks in the Ukraine. He actually spoke a little bit about it last weekend. Alexander, I know it's late where you are. But if you have the energy and are so inclined, it'd be wonderful to have you come up and speak a little bit about what you're doing for the poor folks of the Ukraine and, and what it means to you. Because we've been so inspired by your gift. And, you know, what we're doing here is really something extraordinary. Twitter's never really been used as a philanthropic tool. Usually with philanthropy, there's always a personal connection. So this is kind of a bit different. We're reaching out to people we don't really know. I consider a lot of you friends. I didn't know most all of you six months ago, but we've really been in a sense of community. We're helping each other. And, you know, on what other planet do you get to hear Michael K., Ian Harnett, Bobby J., Tom Thornton? You know, this is just crazy what's going on here. I see Jim Bianco's down the stairs. Maybe he'll come up in a minute. Um, it's just unbelievable. So if you've gotten value from these rooms, please, please, please give generously to World Central Kitchen. The link is in my Twitter feed. And with that, Alexander, it's good to see you again. Um, we were all captivated by what you had to say last Saturday when you made the pledge. Again, I salute you. I'm forever indebted. And this, you know, I don't want to get soft on you guys, but I'm just overwhelmed by everyone's doing the right thing and the thank yous that I get. I'm not doing this for any personal benefit. I'm just trying to help people and try to lead by example. And Alexander, you are leading by example. So maybe, Alexander, could you just talk a little bit about your perspective on the Ukraine, and I know, I mean, probably many of the people um, that are in this room were not in the room last Saturday when you spoke about what you've been doing. Maybe you could just share with us a little bit about, you know, what you've been doing and what you see going on. Thank you, Alexander. Welcome. 
Yeah, thanks, George. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's true, it's getting late here, but uh, let me uh, let me help a little bit. And thanks for what you guys are doing. And it's a pure pleasure to uh, to have made my proposal. And I hope you guys are going to be successful, hopefully, after these spaces, because, you know, the guests that you bring up are just amazing. And I think people can learn so much for free. It's just amazing. Now, um, our little story here is that uh, two weeks ago, we... Uh, in my parents' house, we um, um, received eight refugees from from Ukraine, and I was in Ukraine many, many times in my career. I was in private equity before, and so uh, I, I, it also brought me there. I never did business there, but, um, you know, the beautiful people and uh, a difficult country at the time to operate, but, but now, obviously, it's a, a completely different situation. And they have, um, you know, uh, a lot of refugees. So those that came to us, to our house, were only women, women of all age. So kids, uh, models in the range of two models uh, in the range of 123, 125, and then their models, and no, no, no men. So, and we couldn't talk to them because they only spoke Russian and uh, no one on our end speaks any Russian, although um, we speak quite some languages. It was really hard to communicate. And then we got some help on the, on the translation and we figured out their story. And um, <clears throat> the story was that they came out of Mariupol and um, they were part of that group that was well uh, communicated in the press that, you know, the Russian army has literally slaughtered their men in front of them. And all the rest that I don't want to repeat here, uh, but that everyone knows well what happened to the women as well. And, and so um, they more or less slept uh, for two weeks. And then my mom at some point got, a, you know, other than the food and everything else that we provide them and try to, you know, get the documentation right so that they can stay in Switzerland. And, and they just can, uh, you know, slowly come out of the trauma they have. Um, my mother organized for them, she's a lovely woman, um, organized for them um, someone to cut their hair. And um, that person then came to my mom and to me and said, look, these women already, are, you know, uh, when, when you cut the hair, you see the, 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 the structure below the hair. And the structure below the hair for them was all white already within two weeks. So that's the trauma they're going through. And it's really, uh, it's, it's brutal what's going on out there. And it's, uh, it's no doubt a genocide. And um, so whatever we can do, let's do it. And no, I'm going even as far, George, as if we get that money together, maybe, you know, I put a small group here together or people that, you know, from Twitter that have something to say. And maybe we just go there for a week and help these guys prepare the food in, in Ukraine. I don't know if, he, if I can logistically do it, but let me handle those markets first for two weeks and then hopefully we can make it what we call active vacation over there. So that's my story. Over to you. Yeah, Alexander, thank you so much. Um, you're really building, providing meaning for so many people and, you know, leave, make, leaving the world a better place than we, than we, than, than we found it. I mean, Many of the people in this room have been pretty fortunate um, and you know, giving back. I think it's so important. And, and I salute you and I thank you. And um, I'm sure that when we reach a $200,000 goal, this will uh, create quite a stir. And I suspect it'll be caught, picked up by the mainstream media. And uh, Alexander, not to embarrass you, but um, you featured prominently in our efforts. And so... Um, recognition is, is deserved and um, I suspect this is going to lead to even bigger and better things. So again, what we're doing here has never been done before. So it's truly extraordinary and it wouldn't be possible without your help. You know, I'll remind people when you, when you made the pledge the other day, the room was going pretty well. The next thing we know, this is public, I'll repeat his name, but Jan Van Eck responded with a $10,000 gift. And, you know, since you made that matching challenge, You've raised about $45,000, so $43,000. So it's having the desired effect. So we're very good investor, Alexander, not just in 
commodities and shipping, but also in, uh, in, in philanthropy. So I thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for doing that, George. So, and uh, over it. to you, maybe just one comment on the market. I mean, for the last 10 days, the only thing I can say from where I sit is that liquidity is gone. I mean, we uh, we had quite a well-diversified portfolio and obviously, uh, you know, uh, play safe from here. And it was extremely hard for the last 10 days to sell. You know, anything below 10 million market cap just has zero liquidity. It's brutal out there. Exactly. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, and we'd actually also heard that in the credit market as well, that although the indicative prices are there, if you try and trade in any kind of size, then potentially, you know, the spreads could be, you know. Right. And in, 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 in the same vein, Alexander, I got a call this afternoon from one of my Boston friends and amongst the big Boston institutions. I mean, he was pulling his hair out. He wanted to shoot himself in the head. He's like, George, all this stuff's going down. He's like, nobody sold anything. It was it's a buy, you know it's a buyer strike it's a buyer strike so that's I mean, that's exactly but, how I see it George it's yeah, incredible yeah, yeah, we are selling like, Mickey you know, we're selling you know, Mickey Mouse and are moving the market it's it's really uh, in German some cots you know it's really I mean it's brutal yeah and so so they say it's a buyer strike this that and everything else nobody sold anything and everyone's sitting there saying well you know and Ian I'm going to push it back to you everyone's like well I like my stocks I like my companies blah 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 they're all just looking at the earnings. And Ian, as we know, earnings are a laggy indicator. So the lack of macro awareness. I mean, Ian, you've been around. Let me, let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me interrupt for a second, okay? So I was talking today in one of my Twitter rants about how this is like the biggest bubble I've ever seen in my life. This is worse than anything I've seen before. This is the everything bubble. And someone took me to task, oh, how can you say this is worse than Japan and blah, blah, blah. The problem is it's been everything. It's been stocks. It's been bonds. It's been commodities. It's been collectibles. It's been baseball cards. So... And the role that excess liquidity has has played in that. And so people are myopically looking at the earnings of every stock they're in love it with. They go, it's got good management and this, that, and everything else. You look at the, the rearview mirror. So, Ian, I mean, the so, sort of trying to play micro and macro and then comparing this bubble to past bubbles. Like, what thoughts would you have around any of that? Well, as you know, you know, we've seen a number of bubbles, uh, both of us, George, over the, over the last Bit of four decades, um, you know. I, I joined the Bank of England on in, in October 1985, the same day as Andrew Bailey. Uh, we, we were on the same in the same cohort, um, and you know, I left the Bank of England uh, in the late 1980s. Um, you know, and so I've been you know an economist first, and then a strategist since the mid 1990s. So you know, we've we've seen plenty of bubbles. We've seen them come and go. You know, they are always liquidity driven. You know, they always require debt. And the only thing is how that debt gets used. But I think that what you described about it being the everything bubble is true, where, you know, we haven't until this time seen the attempt to hold down bond yields so aggressively, so egregiously. And the intervention um, of policymakers in the market, you know, it really has. You do go back to the 1950s. Uh, you know, with the financial repression at that stage when they were trying to, to solve the problem of the debt um, post-war. You know, we haven't got that post-war environment, but they've been doing the same kind of thing. And unsurprisingly, that's led to very elevated prices right away across the board. Thanks for that, Ian. Uh, let's go to um, death, death Cross Capital Management, followed by uh, Bowtide. So, Death Cross, good to see you again. What's up? All right. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, I guess I just had a question about what you guys think about the path for. So if we fast forward past all this, you know, credit blows up and everything. What does the path for QE look like after this? Does it does it look like there's is the economy or, or markets? Do they settle for any less than the kind of thing we did in response to COVID? Are we going to go to more of a, a measured or <laughs> measured? We we're going to go to like a, a, a less policy like we had after after the GFC, although it's sustained for a long time. And if that's the case, um, in, in either case, how do we just not wind up exactly where we are right now? You know, we had, we had talked about how, you know, real estate's a concern. Well, it's still going to become real estate prices are going to go right back up there. Right. If if we keep if we keep the, the foot on the gas of QE, you know, in a, in a year and a half, two years from now. So, but, you know, I think. 
uh, you know, one answer to that would be look at what China is doing. So China has tried to, to, you know, wean itself off the drug and it's had had troubles doing so. So, you know, my guess is that we'll see the the same kind of sequencing that we saw post GFC, uh, sorry, post, you know, GFC and then pandemic, you know, that we'll we'll see this tightening on the quantitative side. Then they'll start to, you know, to, to see the impact in terms of the real economy and the financial markets. And they will need to, they will almost certainly resor- resort to, um, you know, first of all, cutting rates, then providing additional liquidity via some kind of quantitative easing mechanism again. Uh, but they'll probably dress it up as something else. Um, so Ian, let me ask you a hypothetical. Imagine where markets would be. Imagine where markets would be if there were never this was never a pandemic. This is a ridiculous kind of factual, but imagine where markets would be if there never was a pandemic. You know, would we have ever had the massive fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus? Of course not. And so now we go from the world that we're in. Again, you have to trade the market you have, not the market you want to have. Go from the world that we're in which is clearly not sustainable. I mean, the idea that, I mean, imagine we're in 17th century Holland and you know, the whole Dutch economy is tied to the price of tulip bulbs. And the central bank is furiously worried about the price of tulip bulbs collapsing. You know, the answer is not doing more of the same to catch you in the trouble in the first place. You've got to let the price of tulip bulbs find its clearing price. And so, and so, and I would actually say, I'm going to get on my soapbox now and actually say, so now we're going to go really cr- sorry. Well, hold on, I'm not going to go crazy just yet. But when you think about the mess of the world we've created with all this pandemic, um, hold on just one second, please. All right, no problem. So Ian needs tea, and I'm going to get a tea also. So Ian, when you think about the world we've created and the normalization that we're undertaking. Like, inevitably, aren't there going to be dislocations as we go from oh, yeah. there? Yeah, undoubtedly, George, there will be dislocations. And then, you know, what we will see is it will become a political issue again. You know, the political question will be how much pain will politicians be prepared to, to accept? You know, and, um, you know, will the Federal Reserve, you know, as I say, the thing that strikes me is that the Federal Reserve, given the level of credit in the economy, um, particularly for the corporate sector, that will be the determining factor as to how quickly they are prepared to see credit spreads, um, you know, stabilize at a, a new higher level. Hey, Bobby J, are you still there, Bobby? Yep. Could you speak to, I mean, every day we ask you the question, but the market's moving quickly. Uh, are, are the smoke detectors, where are the smoke detectors now? With credit? They're not even yellow in terms of um, below They're investment not even grade. Yellow. Some, 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 uh, high yield names are blowing up. I think Endo blew up today. Endo Pharmaceutical, uh, but you know, by and large, um, they're intact. As I said before, I think European credit spreads will widen first. And um, Ian's point about emerging is something to uh, to keep an eye on. So I'd like to hear more about what he said about that. But otherwise. Um, yeah, it's not it's not been a problem yet. So, all right, so, so, so nothing to see or carry on. So, Ian, just speak about European credit spread specifically. You know, I think the you know the the problem with the European credit market is just it's so illiquid. You know, compared to the to the you know the the even the emerging markets in the, uh, the certainly the U.S. market. So, I think one of the things that you see is that you know I actually think from that point of view, bunt yields coming down. As I say, our models suggest bunt yields could almost come down 100 basis points in the next six to 12 months um, because of the weakness of economic growth that you're likely to see in the eurozone. The, but, you know, what we saw when that happened in 2011, 2012 was that was the thing that actually triggered problems for Italy about debt sustainability, because that lack of economic growth you know, is, is really very critical for um, the stabilization of um, you know, the, uh, the, the eurozone credit market. I think the, the, the thing about the emerging markets uh, credit is, you know, it's about it's about the fact that the level of dollar denominated borrowing outside the US has just continued to rise and rise and rise. It's well over 12 trillion dollars now. It didn't pause for breath during the pandemic. 
And you know, the, this is where the strength of the dollar is the thing that's really going to unsettle um, you know, those emerging market economies. And you know, they will have to try and um, you know, stabilize their own domestic economies um, you know, at some point. Uh, because of the uh, uh, because of the stress that they're seeing, and I think one of the things that China is actually trying to do here is to create domestic liquidity to try and replace some of that dollar liquidity that would be creating um, stress for them. By the way, that, that's very well said, Ian. And by the way, I put it up in the nest, but we're going to have a little game with Ian. We're going to taunt him now. So Ian is new to Twitter, and I put his um, I put his uh, Twitter <laughs> Twitter handle up in the nest so i want a little experiment so let's see let's see who's paying attention ian um i want everyone to follow ian we want to get ian back in this i room. need i need to actually okay. have to start doing things on uh, okay so, so ian ian he was at 43 and two people just followed him he's at 45 now so let's let's show ian the power of this room <laughs> i want everyone to follow ian and then i'll have to start actually posting now i have to start posting you don't have to start coming in this room. You don't start getting paranoid about, you know, how many Twitter followers he has. He's going to be jealous of the fact that, you know, mine's bigger than his and so on and so forth. So I want everyone to follow Ian, please. Ian, at Ian R. Harnett. So there you go. All right. Two so look, T's. And no T in the middle because of that Michael guy. Yeah, who is that Michael guy? <laughs> who is it's that Michael guy? It's a pain in the ass. Do you ever get mistaken for the, <laughs> the Michael guy? Uh, no, he's better looking than I am. Uh, but I used to hope in the Excel votes, um, you know, that, that I'd pick up his Excel votes. You got some of those? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why we've been number one rated <laughs> Excel independent research right. business for the last 10 yeah. years. So there you go. Did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? Number one Excel rated. So get out your credit cards. We want to make Alexander pay. <laughs> Come on. We need $7,000, I think, before we started this room, $6,000. If someone wants to put up a match, a, 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 a pledge on a pledge, we're down to the last 10 minutes. And then after that, you have to put up with me. So I want to go quickly. If you have a question for Ian, fine. But if it's, if it's off topic, I don't want you asking it because I will stick around for a bit longer. So first, we're going to go back to Gnostic and then Bowtie. If you have a question for Ian, ask it. Otherwise, please hold your question. I will answer it once Ian leaves. But we're into the last 10 minutes of Ian being, being here. He's been very generous with his time. It's over two hours and ten minutes, but I think he got a nice steak dinner out of it, so everything's okay. So, Nas, do you have a question for Ian? Yep. Well, I got I got three things. One real quick. George, punch in the arm. Please put it up. I couldn't see it in the nest. And please repeat what his thing is so I can actually go to it. I suspect other people are having the same problem. Number two, uh, for everybody that's donating, um, I started donating to people who were leaving and pay for their accommodation in Portugal and some other places along with food and other things independently because I had no way of sitting down and doing it. So I would highly suggest you, you know, donate to this cause because there are people out there that are just, they, they just don't know what to do. And when Ian was describing people coming in, they were just traumatized. The trauma I'm hearing from people that I'm helping is just stunning. They're, they're left literally speechless for weeks on end when they get there and then they want to get back and they can't get back. And it, it, it's just, it's horrible for them. So, you know, please do help out. Ian, question to you. Uh, you said liquidity in Europe was bad. Could you give me some feeling for why it's bad? Uh, just that you know, the, you don't have the the, uh, the depth of um, liquidity in the credit market. You know, is my perception and what I hear from from clients. So the ability to deal in size. And so if we start to see global liquidity coming under pressure, you know, then the probable, um, you know, the, the lack of potential uh, liquidity um, uh, is, um, is going to be one of the, 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 the problems. So, so, I mean, in terms of liquidity, I mean the ability to trade in the uh, underlying assets without moving the markets as opposed to the lack of liquidity. Although, you know, in terms of money growth, but if we look at those money growth numbers in real term, then we can also see European um, real money growth is actually, you know, quite subdued as well, really quite subdued as well. So, you know, um, the, the ECB isn't really pumping lots of cash in at the current time. And as we know, they're actually, you know, looking to, uh, to, to, to you, know, uh, you know, reduce the asset purchase plans um, program and then you know, raise rates. Probably not in July, as some people have suggested, but Lagarde 
um, talked yesterday suggesting that it was probably going to be September instead. Was that okay? Uh, that was, yeah, that was great. Thank you. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, Bowtie, uh, you have a question for uh, Michael, uh, for Ian? Otherwise, if it's something not for Ian, I want you to hold it. So, Bowtie, you got a question? 100%. Hey, George, just want to say thanks for having me back on. And, uh, Ian, nice to hear from you. Thank you. I just had a quick question about the liquidity in the U.S. markets. So, of course, yep. we've been seeing it dry up recently, but as long as the U.S. labor market stays hot, can they stay off, stave off an absolute dry up? Since Theoretically, there'd be more money flowing in since people will have income in 401k funds and the like. I, you know, I think the, the problem is that, yes, yeah, so that's it. There's clearly it's one of those factors. But what we've had is over the last couple of years, we had the, the uh, pandemic checks providing a real source of additional liquidity. And you can see that in the, the FINRA uh, margin debt numbers. And those FINRA margin debt numbers correlate very nicely with both changes in the equity market um, and also you know, with changes um, in some of the, the meme stocks as well. So you know, with that margin debt now starting to be run down, you know, just the income, the, the, the liquidity purely from income going into 401ks is not, um, is not really enough. So I think that's the problem. And then if you take the institutional liquidity out, you know, because of those quantitative tightening, you know, then that's the uh, that would be um, you know, a, a real drag. So employment is not enough, I think, is the answer to uh, to, to that. Um. Awesome. Thank you. Well, not awesome, but uh, thank you so much. For being <laughs> All right. So so newsflash, newsflash. So, Mr. Harnett. Yes. You had 43 Twitter followers <laughs> 10 minutes ago. You now have 272. Thank you very much, George. You just got your 229 I, Twitter followers. So I now, to, I need to, so now I the need pressure's to on. To, you have to start somebody, getting... The, you'll have to teach me how to tweet, George. Well, we got Rob DeLuca, by the way, a very good friend I've known for three decades. Um, he works with Ian. He's based here in New York. So you'll get to know him as well. Um, I think we're talking about he's going to have to be in charge of the ASR Twitter account. But at any rate, um, see Ian, see? 272. So fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody that's that's um, you know uh, followed me. So one of the things that we do at Absolute Strategy Research is we try and provide context for um, institutional investors and investors around the world. And you know one of the things we do that by is using macro to market charts. We also um, you know run the uh, the world uh, you know leading um, asset allocation survey. Uh, my business partner David Bowers was one of the. Um, uh, originators of the, uh, the the Merrill survey, the, um, the fund manager survey, the fund manager survey. survey, yeah, the Bank of yep. America yep. Merrill survey. So we've created a, an analogous survey to that, and we'll put up the results from that um, uh, asset allocators survey uh, when we'll get that. But we like posting charts. We like using charts to show the relationships between macro to market. We've got a chart library of twenty thousand macro to market relationships, and we also you know look at the cross asset cross checks so quite often you'll find that people have got what should be really contradictory views between different asset classes without really recognizing it so george has been a great person at, at uh, helping us un uncover and untangle some of those over the years because he always asks such smart questions oh stop uh, it. but you know those cross asset cross checks really try and help you avoiding making you know too many errors um, along so, the way. Yeah, so, for instance, for those of you who aren't as macro aware, cross market aware, give an example. So, so, so give a couple of crazy examples. So a crazy example, which is um, copper versus gold, is basically the same as equities versus bonds. Right. Um, you know, there's a, a tremendous high correlation between tips and investment. Or, or, or let's make it a little bit crazier. Let's go cross border. JGB's. Against pharmaceuticals versus, you know, copper uh, well, and some yeah, crazy it's, stuff it's like that. It's, it, that tends to be, you tend to find Japanese utilities against Korean uh, industrials that are really yeah. good. So, so know, pro cyclical yeah. uh, or you know, anti anti cyclical trade in that kind of place. So, 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 tech he, versus value is just the same as, sorry, tech versus banks is just the same as growth versus value. Right. 
And so you look to see where the cross market yeah, um, relationships are evaluated. And, and where that, you know, where you're starting to see some gaps open up, which makes sense economically, um, and you know, which ones just look absolutely crazy. So that that's actually terrific. So uh, Ian's Ian and I are waiting for his tea, but I think we're down to once the tea comes. Well, you're not going to let it seep for like 20 minutes. No, so no, no, no. Okay, no, right. I, I, you know, all right, fine. It'll okay. be it'll be done and down. Okay, so you'll be a one and done. All right, so oh, my good friend over here, how are you? you got a you got a, good to see you. Got a friend? You got a question for Ian? Hey guys, okay. yeah, I have a question. Yep, can you hear me? Yeah, we're good. We yep. can do that. Fantastic. Hey, you guys are having too much fun over there, man. I'm jealous. <laughs> we're trying not uh, to. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, where? <clears throat> Based on kind of the um, everything that you guys have spoken about here, uh, and there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot to, to, to kind of unpack here in this conversation, uh, and it's fantastic. I love it. But uh, let me ask you, where, where do you think uh, we are in terms of time and price, in terms of this decline? Uh, this thing could drag on for a long, long time. I mean, I think a lot of the retail investors out there, the tens of millions of mom and pops out there that are kind of investing for the long run, I still haven't seen any kind of indication that, that people are – you know, hell bent on, on getting out. So my kind of my thought is that we're kind of in the very beginning stages of this, so we could see some pretty significant counter tra- uh, trend rallies here. What are your thoughts on that? And, um, you know, because again, the, the, the macro uh, backdrop as it, it is getting worse, it's not, you know, I, I wouldn't call it like a capitulatory right now. So what are your thoughts on that? And like the compression of all this information into smaller and smaller kind of uh, packets, if you will? Uh, you know, I think that all of those points are there, as you say, counter trend rallies will be a feature. Um, you know, what we've typically seen is that these reversals take, you know, if it's not something like a pandemic, then I think that, you know, it, it could well take you know, six to 12 months at, at least. Um, you know, if, if let's hope it doesn't accelerate too aggressively, um, because that would obviously be, you know, pretty, pretty um, challenging. But I think the thing that the thing that I want to see is that what we haven't yet seen is a compression of valuations um, across different sectors. Uh, so you know, although we've seen you know some of the very expensive stuff come down, it's still not you know it's not into the the the, the kind of real compression of PEs or price to books across global sectors that um, you know you've had um, in the past so you know from that perspective I think there's an awful long way to go oh yeah so yeah you're, 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 you're absolutely right so you know lots uh, lots of still lots of stuff has got to happen before we get to the so, so, so let me take a swing of that I mean Ian would it be correct if you just do it from a purely bottom-up basis forget all the top-down nonsense and we're all trying to pontificate about Fed policy and economic cycles but if you just look pure bottom up, relative to history, relative to whatever benchmark, maybe history is not the right one because bond yields are different from much longer than they used to be. But however you choose to look at it, be it, you know, say, say you take a price to book or EV to sales for a given company or an industry, relative to its own history or relative to some bond adjusted valuation metric, how would you characterize valuations broadly speaking in markets? And what are anomalous in terms of you know, what's really cheap now or what's still like multiple standard deviations above where historically it bottoms? You know, you so, know I never asked yeah, easy no, they, they, So the good news is that George also knows that I carry around a pack of about 150 charts that can uh, try and answer all the tricky questions that we, uh, that we get. So the bottom line is that nothing is really cheap at the moment, George. Stop, stop, stop. Did you hear that? Nothing is really cheap. Nothing is really cheap. So given all the bombs that are going off, worries about lockdown in China, Ukraine, Russia, the earnings cycle, retails, retailers perhaps starting to panic. You know, there are no certainties in life. Everything is risk reward. So when the man says nothing is really cheap, like why would you own equities right now? Sorry, Ian, I had to that, That's okay. And obviously that's not the ASR house view. Uh, because people do have to own equities if they're fully invested as asset managers. So they need to own something. Um, but, you know, just to put that in context, global banks are on a, a price to book around about 0.9, um, you know, their low point over the last decade. So even post GFC, 
was 0.6. Okay. So that's another. By the way, are your banks still a, the, the odoriferous pile of origin? Yeah, they, been, well, they, like, they, like they, are, they, are, they are at the moment. And you don't want to, one of our, another uh, wacky rule of thumbs is that you don't want to buy a region until you can buy their banks. So you don't want Love to go that. overweight Eurozone or Japan until you think Eurozone and Japanese banks have got more upside than U.S. banks. But, you know, something. So what, what do people like? What would what, what would you find in your spaces that people want to buy then, George? They, they, they still want to live the dream. They still want to, the technology is OK. That's what they. So always, it's you know, it's like it's like when you have a, an old girlfriend, or old boyfriend. And it's like you break up and it's like, you know, oh, if I could just get back together again, it's usually not a good idea. OK, so they still want to keep running the technology play and the growth play. So how do those things stack it's up? It's been 40 years since I've had that problem. So, <laughs> uh, so you know, so technology globally is uh, on a price to book, trailing price to book around about five. Even in the last 10 years, the average price to book was three and the low price to book was just over two and a bit. Prose- <laughs> Prosecution rest, your witness. Um, um, yeah, so, you know. The- but how, how is, okay, so there are a bunch of energy bulls in the room. I want to talk about that for a second, right? So leaving aside the cyclical downturn. All right, so let me, let me rein in your parade. So let's, thing- imagine gr- let's imagine economic growth doesn't slow, George. Yeah, no, no, I- no, 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 no. Let's imagine economic growth does slow. Well, let's also recognize oil demand has only gone down three years, three times in the last 50 years. And oil demand tends to be sort of kind of like GDP minus. So, so it's only been the early 70s, um, the, um, uh, the great financial crisis, and most recently with COVID, that we had declines in oil demand. So it drives the oil. So I'm going to I'm gonna kind of mess with you a little bit, as, as I usually do. Um, so the issue isn't the demand side, really. The real issue is the supply side. And as you know, uh, energy, oil industry capex is down 70% in real terms the last you know, eight years. And so regardless of what demand is doing, because of every company was punished for you know, losing so much capital, if you're a CFO of an energy company, the last thing you want to do is put another hole in the ground. But on top of it, not to mention the shame you get from the whole ESG crowd, so there hasn't the supply response has been zilch so far. So what if we get a situation where, you know, okay, so there may be a half a million, a million less barrels consumed our lives would in the case you get a recession, but it doesn't really go down very much. And also keep in mind that we've got ongoing depletion every year of like four or five percent. So if you look at like years of reserves and everything, that thing's going down, 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 down. All right. In the same way, if I said to you, gee. Food Japan's not gonna food Japan's not gonna change very much regardless of what the Fed does. Okay. So what I was surprised is you get a slowdown if you are now if you're gonna say big recession, then okay, mail it in on the stock market. That's a whole other question. Let's just say we get a slowdown, recession, whatever, and all demand comes off the boil, it doesn't collapse. But between ongoing depletion and the fact we've had no real drilling for extra uh, production, there's no supply response. And so how, how would you how would you respond to that? So I, I'll revisit one of the things we said earlier in the space, George. You know, the, the danger is um, mixing a structural story and a cyclical story. So your structural story is absolutely correct. You know, the, the underinvestment, um, it means that there's going to be a fantastic income stream coming off energy stocks. But, you know, that's going to be like, you know, the it's the same as the play that we had in tobacco stocks you know, in the 1980s and 1990s. So what will change over the next decade for um, energy stocks is that they will become dividend payers. That's all that they will do. You know, you will get income out of them and the total return will equilibrate through the price, not necessarily doing the work. Um, It would be my view. I think there is a lot of value to be made in um, energy stocks. You know, so the 0.72 idea, you know, we've been talking about it to clients for the last few years, splitting you know, the energy companies into good good energy and bad energy. We do it with a bank. You would just put all the bad stuff in, in an entity and you'd let investors that could invest in it and want to invest in it, invest in it. And the, 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 the good stuff, the energy, the, the green energy stuff, you give them the correct cost of capital to rebuild the global infrastructure in a different way. So structurally, 
you know, you will probably do okay. Cyclically, you know, energy prices, you know, you know, the the oil price could come down dramatically. Would be my fear. You know, if we see a major economic slowdown, so it's a question of entry point into that trade, George. And right. at the moment, I'd I'd hold off that entry point. By the way, just to let you know, Ian, you were mesmerizing with the comments. There are over uh, a thousand people in this room right now. Well, thank they're you. Hanging, they're hanging on your every <laughs> word. Well, all I can do is thank you very much, George, for inviting me to join you this evening. Um, I'm sorry that we haven't managed to get it together earlier no, uh, because fantastic. we've so, been trying to talk it, right. sort it out so, for a while. So, so don't panic. You're going to have to put up with me because I'm going to stay here. But, uh, Ian, I think um, we're going to have you on your way. It's, it's, it, are you still jet lagged from uh, your uh, trip over? I am, I am still pretty jet lagged and I've got a very busy day. And this is the, uh, the seventh um, event that I've done today. But the most interesting one. Yeah. And uh, some of you may have seen me on Bloomberg. <laughs> Um, oh. This morning at ten o'clock. So uh, fantastic! Yeah, no, so, All right, so you uh, know what? I will, I will find. You, you know what you need to do? You need to tweet your appearance on Bloomberg. Uh, well, the trouble is that they only they Bloomberg are sneaky. They, they do only do? they they don't actually put on individual people very frequently unless you're a policymaker. Uh, so you have to look at the whole program that um, uh, was the uh, the ten o'clock show with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Um, and uh, but you'll find me towards the top of the program. Um, uh, after the first five to six minutes, uh, of that program. That's terrific. Um, so, Ian, I want to I want to bid you goodbye. I'm going to stay thank here. You, George. Right? Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we Tell will... me if you bad mouth me via Twitter, please. <laughs> <laughs> after I've turned my back. So, gone. so, so the pressure's on now, Ian. So, welcome to uh, the social media rat race. Um, this has been fantastic. I hope you'll. I hope if we can do this again before too long. Yeah, no, that'd um, be very good. And obviously, you know, if we have a change of heart or a change of view, George. Then, um, for, sure, and, uh, for sure, for sure, for sure. sure and, and again, please, everyone follow Ian. The Ian and David Bowers are two of the sharpest cookies I know. And what I really like about their work, aside from that they've been through a lot of cycles, I mean, they probably have, I don't know, 80 years of experience between them, is that they really are global in their perspective. So a lot of what's going on in the States, the key drivers are what's happening elsewhere. Um, and so they, 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 they're as good a European watcher or Asia watcher as anybody I know. So... It's a differentiated, a differentiated point of view, and I fully expect that in the months and years to come, we'll be doing a lot more in these spaces together. And hopefully, you'll you'll be coming back Thank soon. Thank you very much. George. That's great. So, uh, so thanks for that, Ian. So let's go to ten, and then Phoenix. Ten, you got a question? Yeah. Hello. Uh, so I have two questions. Actually, they span very different time frames. Oh well. First off, thank you very much for arranging this. And I mean, I would have uh, liked or appreciated to hear Ian's uh, comments uh, regarding my questions. But anyway, so the two questions span very different time frames. One of them is very in the short term and the other one's in the long term. So for the one in the long term, it's uh, distracting. I mean, let's forget a bit about the situation right now, the equity markets and the whole uh, Fed policy, what they're doing and all those shenanigans. Looking very long term, I mean, we all seem to be in agreement that this never-ending cycle of QE and QT has sort of solidified itself. And what I'm wondering is, what does that mean in the future for a strategic asset allocation perspective? I mean, what do you uh, think I, that I, would I'm be? sorry, Tim, we had a little bit of a breakup. Well, what is the question, oh. please? So in regards to, so the question is, basically, this cycle of QE and QT seems to be, it seems to be entrenched, right? And looking in the long term, uh, I mean, what, what would be your perspective once we get out of this hurdle and the Fed starts easing once again and the monetary stimulus comes in? And from what Ian said, fiscal stimulus uh, also comes in uh, just as dominant or just as pervasive. What does that mean for assets? I mean, at, from a macro level, uh, what, what's your bet? Like, what do you think would happen to the dollar in that case? Uh, do you have a uh, what would be your your whole I mean, how would you construct your portfolio in that case? There's a lot to unpack in that. I mean, let's not, let's leave the dollar aside for a second. That's too trick. Let's talk about QE and QT. The central bank has no business doing this. This is unprecedented. It's a giant experiment. And the more skeptical amongst us would say that it really didn't do a hell of a lot for economic growth. All it did was push up and down asset prices. So, you know, in a perfect world, they wouldn't be doing any of this nonsense. And to be candid, I mean, where I kind of miscalculated, I never thought that they would do as much as they did. Never before in history 
have asset prices been such the sort of uh, explicit objective of central banks? They completely distorted the market. They broke the market. So my hope would be that this wouldn't this wouldn't uh, occur again. Who knows? I mean, it's hard enough trying to just figure things out over the next months or year. You're asking a very good question, but it's, it's that's beyond my pay grade. So sorry, I can't be more explicit. I, I just think they they have no business doing this stuff. It's a complete insanity, and you know, I don't want to get into a political discussion about it, but. You know, it's gone a long way towards promoting uh, income inequality, which is something this administration is opposed to. So I think it'll be a cold day in hell before they do. I mean, it would take a real market wipeout for them to engage in QE again. Um, They're so opposed to that right now. So thank you for the question. Phoenix, you're up next. What's up, Phoenix? Hey, thank you. Um, My question is, in the geopolitical competition we have, um, and markets are also very vital into that. Um, what happens if Russia and China decide to hold back their commodities? I mean, they're essentially cornering the market in certain things, right? Um, and then what could the Fed do? And as well, while we are not, while we are in this multipolar world or going into that, what happens if we do have a real crisis? In 2008, everyone worked together to fix this. In 2000. 16, and if you believe in the Shanghai Accord, the central banks work together to sort this out. What if international finance is weaponized? Excellent question. I believe it's already happening. You know, say whatever you want about Putin. I mean, he's, he's awful. He's heinous. It's, it's, it's despicable what he's done. Crimes against humanity. But he's not stupid. And the war that we're in, the wars that we'll be in, will be less fought on the battlefield and more in markets and information. And I'm sure it's not lost upon him that the weakness of the West is their market structure, their economies. And so if I were him, you know, people say, oh, Russia. If I, if I read one more idiot, I say idiot, the talking heads, the mainstream media, well, you know, the, the GDP of Russia is only the size of Spain or it's only the size of Texas, yada, yada, yada. The second biggest producer of oil in the world. They're up in the league tables in terms of grain production. Ditto ability to wreak havoc in cyberspace and nuclear. For such a third-rate country of economic power, they've got a hell of a lot of leverage. And Putin ain't dumb. So if I were him, I would you know, and given the difficulty of winning on the battlefield, the way to really inflict pain on the West is just drag this thing out. And I think that's what he's going to do. So, no, it has been weaponized. And you also see how they've now tried to uh, tie the ruble to natural gas prices or gold prices or whatever. There's more where that came from. And honestly, when you think about it, that's a hell of a more legitimate standard than some bullshit fiat currency stuff where they just print trillions of dollars out of thin air. So I, I think this is going to have, I, th- I think we've, we've reached a tipping point. It's going to have repercussions for history going forward. If we lose the ability to you know, control the world's reserve currency, that if somehow some alternative develops, it's a huge advantage that we have that might go away. Who knows? But you touch on a really important topic. And it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, Amazon's earnings next quarter. But in terms of capital flows, interest rates, the dollar, what it means for valuations, what it means for growth, it's hugely important. Your question is a simply simple one, but it's very complicated to answer, but it certainly bears watching. Thank you for that question. Okay, let's go on to uh, X Wall. We're going on to X X Wall Street guy. Hello, X Wall Street guy. How are you? What's up? Hey, George. How you doing? Love the uh, love the spaces. Um, so you were, I guess, a couple of days ago. You said, "Oh, yeah, I think people are going to be surprised on how tough the market gets or how much it goes down." Um, so back in two thousand, you people were rotating out of growth and the value, and it was pretty easy, right? Just sold, you know whatever the Amazon of the day was, you know, Cisco or whatever, and you bought, you know, Wells Fargo. But as you say, this time around, you know, if you look at all these, all those stocks, there is no sort of other yin and yang, right? 
like everything's gone up a lot this time. So what's your, cause you keep alluding to it. I think people are going to be surprised on how much it goes down. What are your thoughts on that? Nothing's really cheap. You know, trying to pick a bottom, like giving first people a, a price target. It's a fool's errand. That's not the way I look at things. I'd actually invite Michael Cantrick to come back up. He's, I think he's back. He doesn't engage in price targets either. Well, let me let me re, let me uh, maybe put it a different way, uh, George. The way I look at things, if you look at it, whether margin debt, uh, all the SPAC stuff, which is kind of like the dot coms, we're down fifty percent in the S and P. But you had the safe harbor of the you know the what do they call back what we call them back then the non uh, the non tech stocks. Um, you don't have that luxury this time because all everything's gone up, like you said. So if it was down fifty percent last time and it was just mainly tech for ninety percent of the bear market, doesn't it sort of if you do the back of the envelope, doesn't that mean something worse than fifty almost? It could. I mean, you know, people talk about. I mean, valuation does not give you. Didn't help you on the way up, telling where the top was and when multiple standard yeah. deviations beyond what people thought, sort of what I thought was possible. It's not going to give you support on the downside. Just you know, if it went, if it went crazy on the upside, you can go crazy on the downside. I'm not predicting this, but just to give you an idea. I remember Peter Lynch telling me, he always tells his Taco Bell story, how you know, he made 40 times his money or whatever. Taco Bell at the bottom in 74 was trading at one times earnings. One times earnings. So the idea, the permables, the apologists, they say, well, you know, the market's on 18 times earnings and the average PE is 16 or whatever it is they say. So maybe there's 10% downside, blah, 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 blah. Right. I mean, I mean, the P is a function of a lot of things. It depends on credit spreads, it depends on growth rates, depends on bond yields. And so to just have this sort of static analysis of where the PE should be, it's like nonsensical. And then if we get Michael K back up here, you know, whatever the S&P earnings estimate is for next year, 230 or 250, I can't even remember. I'm kind of tired right now. You know, if, if he's right, if Ian's right, that number's too high. So let's say consensus earnings are, you know, 250, whatever. Michael K. bail me out here. And, and you know, we roll forward a year, and, and no, it's it's 210 instead of 250. And the PE, instead of being 18, becomes 14. I mean, just do the math. Yeah. You can get to 3,000 really easily. And I think what's happened here is there's this recency bias. People just been extrapolating what's been on for the last few years. And that's why I said, I think, People really shocked how far prices down could go. It's just get out of this sort of liquidity driven bubble that your own pals were driving the bus on and just, you know, slap on some more, some, some numbers that are more in line with history. And I think you'd be shocked how much downside you could see. George, one, one thing I would like you to um, address is that, and Ian was talking about this today, there really wasn't a lot of selling. So we have a liquidity issue that is developing and it's only just begun because the balance sheet reduction hasn't hasn't even started yet so can you talk about how liquidity doesn't know anything about valuations 100 percent. thank you for that bobby j by the way can you please get michael k back up here i don't really raise his hand so he's going to correct me i was trying to channel my inner michael k but I've had a couple of beers, so I'm a little bit I'm not as sharp as I used to be. So, Bobby J., please get Michael K. back up here. Um, so, so to answer the liquidity question, and it, it's a leading question. Saying thanks for the for the tee ball, tee ball, put it teeing it up for me. You, know, you had all this mindless and sensitive buying on the way up, just index nonsense, which is just a large cap momentum strategy with no price discovery at all. People just buying it because number go up and stocks for the long term and. That nice Wharton professor on TV, Jeremy Siegel, said you'll make 9% a year for the next million years. But, you know, what he fails to tell you is entry point matters. I mean, if you bought NASDAQ in 2000, it took, I can't remember, 13 years, 16 years to get back to break even. As opposed to, you know, if you bought it in March of uh, 09, you made, you know, three years return in three months. And so timing is everything. And, and I, I urge everyone to go look at John Hussman's work 
he was early, he was bearish, he was this, he was that. And, and actually, I'm going to tee up Michael. I'm going to tee up Michael K. with a question about Hustman's work. I'm sure he's looked at it. Um, you know, I've always said this, I've said this numerous times. Sometimes the market makes you look smarter than you really are. And sometimes it makes you look dumber than you really are. As Guy had always says, there are no gurus, there are only cycles. So John Hustman ain't looked too bright the last few years. Doesn't mean he was wrong. Never thought that the central bankers of the world would do what they did. But you start looking at valuation not as a tool for what you're going to make the next year. There's zero correlation between valuations and short-term returns. But there's wonderful correlations between valuations and long-term returns. In the Hustman work, I think it's 10 years or 12 years or something like that. So I, I don't know. Um, Michael K., could you speak a little bit about you know, in what time frame, if at all, is valuation a useful indicator to me? I mean, it has to be because, I mean, because by nature, capitalism is mean reverting. If it doesn't mean revert, then capitalism is broken. So how do you think about valuation in the long term scheme of things? Totally acknowledge it in the short run. It does nothing for you. Um, you know, I've seen the Hussman work. I'm, I'm, I'm still a little bit skeptical of some of those relationships because because there's not a ton of samples. Like we've only had extreme valuations twice in late twenties and two thousands, and you know markets. I don't think markets. Again, I don't think the stock market went. And this is gonna, I'm going to say something. You're all going to be like, "What the hell is he talking about?" I don't think the stock market went down in two thousand because it was it was expensive. It went down a lot because it was expensive, but that's not why it went down. It went down because the economy turned down. Because in ninety nine you had similar to what we have now oil oil went through the roof the fed raised rates a lot long bonds went up a lot the dollar rose a lot and that always eventually brings stocks down because it creates a slowdown and you had a lot of tech stocks which were a big size of the market that had no earnings and were high beta and so all that and, and they were purely rising or you can explain their multiple expansion by their five-year earnings estimates so basically as people thought no, these these companies are going to make all this money down the road. They just pushed up the valuation. So as soon as the economy slowed, which is exactly what we're seeing, with stuff like ARC, those estimates get pulled in. And and given that's the only thing holding it up, the valuation that is, uh, those stocks got crushed. Um, I think over the long term, what describes valuation best is is again it's the it's 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 composition of the market. And I tweeted that chart about the energy sector just showing it's not a coincidence that the lows in the energy sector in 2000 and 2020 were also the highs of market valuation. So, right, right. So, we're, so, we're, so, we're, so, so sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. So the number, not the number one question, but a lot of questions we're getting now is revolving around valuation. Yes, valuation's down. And I'll say it again. I don't, th I'll repeat what I said earlier. I don't think, a lot, you know, the market's not down because it was expensive, and I, and I know some of you are probably cringing, but it was it was the rates went up, which pulled the valuations down. If the P, if the market PE was at twelve right now, it would still be lower because when risks rise, valuations come down. It doesn't, and the market doesn't care about whether the stock's trading at seven times PE or twenty five times PE. Valuation. I mean, look at look at GM and Ford. They're trading at a five PE, and they're getting crushed. So it's it's you can't say it's about valuation because it's just not that clean of a way to describe uh, to, to describe it. But the simple answer to when valuation is going to bottom, and this is kind of tongue in cheek, but this is a, this is the way I think about it: when risks peak, valuations will bottom. And that's why I asked that question to Ian before trying to get an understanding of you know what he thought was one of the biggest risks. Right now, in the short term. Let's say CPI comes in at seven and a half on Wednesday. Don't think it will, but no one has a clue, right? And, and, and while everyone expects it to decline, if it really surprises it to the downside, higher inflation has been the number one driver of lower valuations and rates, um, higher, higher inflation, higher rates. And so that's the biggest risk. And if we get a little relief, that'll be where, at least for the time being, valuations will put in a, a floor. And then the earnings are going to collapse and we're going to go lower. But I'm talking about, you know, in a really, really right. short term. So, yeah. So, 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 Michael, let me push back on that a little bit. And I urge you to go look carefully. Everyone should go to it. Go to uh, Hussman Funds, H-U-S-S-M-A-N, HussmanFunds.com. 
And it's a really interesting intellectual exercise, even if you disagree with the outcome. And the title of John's most recent piece from April 27 was Repricing a Market Priced for Zero. Okay. And basically, the idea being that people were putting in, and again, look, Ceteris Paribus, I mean, you're right, valuation tells you nothing. But if you go get to a world where embedded in price is the, is the idea that interest rates are zero, and then that, that assumption changes, prices move. And I keep saying this whole shenanigans with rates and the Fed and suppressing rates, it's akin to holding a beach ball beneath the, surf, the surface of the water. And it stays down there, stays down there, stays down there. And eventually you let go. And what happens? It comes back up. So we can argue bond yields should be a two. They should be a three, whatever. But they didn't belong at 60 basis points. And, you know, as, as you rightly point out, valuations expand as growth rates and disc- growth rates accelerate. You know, earnings increase and discount rates decline. Well, now we have a situation where discount rates are going up because inflation is out of control or has been out of control. And growth is going to slow. So, um, so to, to me, to me, I've read Huston for years, and it makes complete sense what he's saying. Um, and I, I urge urge everyone to to ha- to, to, to have a look. Um, let me find something here. I'm trying to trying to um, uh, here. So here we are. Um, Look at market crashes. One of the interesting features of long, interesting trips to nowhere, in terms of markets going nowhere, is that much of the repricing can occur within a compressed period of time. For example, while the total return of the S&P 500 lagged Treasury bills between 2000 and 2013, a great deal of damage was compressed into the 2000-2002 collapse, after which the market enjoyed a five-year bull market before the global finance, financial crisis emerged. So even though I frankly expect the S&P 500 to like treasury bills for a period of between 10 and 20 years, I also expect very frequent periods of investment opportunity along the way. I would expect the best opportunities to emerge in periods when a material retreat in valuations is joined by an improvement in what I often describe as the uniformity of market internals. Here comes the killer, the killer paragraph as far as I'm concerned. A market crash is nothing but risk aversion meeting a low risk premium. Upward yield pressure meeting an inadequate yield. Both features are necessary. Extreme valuations may set up investors for dismal long-term returns, and they may imply profound market losses over the complete market cycle. But as long as investors have the speculative bit in their teeth, extreme valuations can persist for a very long time before collapsing. So again, it's nothing about timing. When I go back to the first sentence of that paragraph, a market crash is nothing but risk aversion meeting a low risk premium. Upward yield pressure meeting an adequate yield. So what sets up the crash is the high valuation. The high valuation doesn't mean you get the crash, but it's one of the, it's, it's a feature, not a bug, I, I, I guess one would say. And then he continues. Once investor psychology shifts towards risk aversion, everything changes. A trapdoor quietly opens, particularly if interest rates or other competing returns are rising. Sound familiar? The collapse may come, not the collapse may not be immediate, but as the gap widens between this the returns that investors demand and the dismal returns that extreme valuations imply, a panic becomes increasingly likely. Hello, driven by investors simultaneously trying to lock in those extreme valuations. The problem is that every seller requires a buyer. And vertical price declines may be required to draw value-oriented investors to absorb the cascade of sell orders. Once a hyper-valued market is joined by a shift towards risk aversion, which we infer from the tier in the uniformity of market internals and other pre- upper pressures on yields, it's typically best to panic before everybody else does. I can go on and on and on, but the point is, just go to husbandfunds.net and... I think it's, you know, again, again, if you followed his work over the years, his interesting intellectual exercise, you would have been poorer for it. But again, the market, you know, there's no gurus, there are only cycles. And I somehow kind of think, and this is going to be recorded and it can be tweeted and replayed and I don't care. John Hussman is a million times smarter than Kathy Wood or David Portnoy 
or Tremont, a million times more intelligent. You want to take Tremont or Kathy Wood? Bring it. Get her in here right now. Uh, hey, George, can I ask uh, Michael K a question, please? Go for it. Thanks, brother. Um, hey, Mike, how are you, my man? Um, hey, three aces. Uh, hey, bro. good evening. Hey, um, I, I love your opinion on something. Um, I've been getting some WhatsApp messages from some of our other friends here, and um, apparently these stable coins are melting down now. They're they're unpegging uh, or something like this. I am I'm shocked. Curious. Three aces. I I'm shocked. Are you serious? No, can't be. Can't be. Yeah. I'm, our, I'm our shocked. For you. Doomberg is uh, is hunting is pecking away with his beak on WhatsApp here, sending me all these damn things. I'm just I'm just curious, Mike. If I look there, that it says something about um, um, that there's maybe a hundred billion dollars somewhere in these you, these tethered these bit these stable coins, and I look at Bitcoin's total value is five hundred billion. That's twenty percent. Now, I know that you've been having a, a go with it and t- posting a lot of different charts about Bitcoin and correlations to the shit stocks like Kathy and stuff like that. Um, I'm just curious if these things do collapse here and um, and it does take a big hunk out of Bitcoin as a consequence. Do you think that would have any causal effect on the market or do you think everything that's happened with Bitcoin has been a reaction or, you know, a consequence of what the stock market's been doing. Just curious what your take might be on that. Thanks brother. Yeah. um, You know, our, I think one one of the uh, teams, I think it was one one of our policy teams had done work, done some work trying to understand the interplay between crypto and the market. You know, was the market driving crypto or the other way around? Um, You know, we all know that it's become increasingly correlated, I've seen people chart it with the NASDAQ. I, I like to chart Bitcoin with high beta stocks. Um, oh, geez. <laughs> Sorry. Um, will, I mean, it's, any, you know, it's going to be a negative wealth effect. I, I, I don't think like it's going to set off retail margin selling, which then is going to for they're going to sell. They're going to have to like be forced to sell their stocks. I don't, you know, I, I don't really have a good answer. Um, I don't think it's a, I think it's more of kind of an economic thing to think of and consumer confidence thing to think of just given yeah. how many people can kind of be in and out of that stuff. Yeah. So let me, I'm, I'm going to take that one. I'm going to take Sorry, that George. one. I have a very strong opinion about that three aces. I've done a lot of work on that. Um, I urge everyone to go to look at my feed or easier to find it. If you go on Apple or Spotify, Grant Williams did a podcast almost a year ago, it was uh, June, July of last year, Bennett Tomlinson and myself did a whole deep dive on Tether and crypto. And, you know, we normally don't talk crypto in these rooms. I've talked about it a few times. In my view, it's pretty simple. The whole thing is a complete scam, sham. I'll say a few things. One, Tether is the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of the world. I see my good friend Zeb is in the room. If he'd like to come up and speak about this, because we did a lot of work on this a year ago. Um, to put numbers on it, um, Tether, market cap, I think it's about $75 billion. I haven't looked the last couple of weeks. Not to mention Circle and all these other bullshit coins. It's like $100 billion. Let's just stay with Tether for the time being. Going back to the fall of 2020, when Bitcoin was around, I think, 11000 And just sidebar, Michael K's price target's a 13 and mine's 11 and the other way around. Um, as Ian would say, if he was here, that'd be a useful decline. Um, the total market cap of Tether at the time was only about $2 billion. And then the counterfeiting began. There were tens and tens and tens of billions that Tether created, the vast majority of which I believe is counterfeited. And so you say, okay, well, George, what are you getting all exercised about? There's only $75 billion worth of, uh, I've, I've given this spiel a bunch of times. Only $75 billion worth of Tether out there. And, okay, $19 million Bitcoin, and that's down to 30000 So it's, okay, but even now it's $570 billion. So $175, one five seventy. what are you worried about? Uh-uh. you got to think about market structure and float. Specifically, um, the market cap of Bitcoin in the fall of 2020, with Bitcoin at about 11000 and 18 million coins outstanding, was about $200 billion. 
the non hob of the Philly Sporting Supply is only about 20% of that, or 40 billion. So, you know, Bobby J, I'm going to ask you a question. I hope you're listening. Bobby J, uh, if I said to you, here, I want you to go buy some Bitcoin. Here's $70 billion. Go buy me some Bitcoin. And I said, Bobby J, the available supply is only $40 billion. Uh, do you think you could push the price up a little bit with that? Uh, yeah. Well, don't ask a question if you know the answer, George. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so the whole thing is a scam. A complete scam. Total scam. And all the bullshit that's gone on with it. And I don't want to hear about the technology and number go up, bro. And it's digital gold and Hayek and Austrian economics. As Jim Cramer famously once said about Bear Stearns, when he's screaming and yelling about bailing them out or the whole system's going to blow up. These crypto bulls know nothing. They know nothing. I, I urge everyone to go and listen to Peter Atwater's. Uh, we had him in the room last week about why people do stupid things and extension of time preferences and buying crazy things like, you know, taking out mortgages on real estate in the metaverse, all this insane stuff, NFTs. This is tulip bulbs on steroids. At least when there were tulip bulbs or you had the, the, the crazy tech stuff in 2000, you see had tulip bulbs in Holland in the 17th century. You got a flower. Or you bought Global Cross and you got a piece of fiber optic that wasn't used for a while. This, this is complete vaporware. And this could not have happened. This could not have happened. Would not have happened. If the cost of capital was hadn't gotten so distorted, if we hadn't had zero, you know, such low interest rates. So just as, you know, higher real rates are the enemy of gold, ditto for um, crypto. And the other thing is the, the central banks around the world, the authorities are getting wise to this. The Chinese have it in for it. The Europeans have it in for it. You know, Gary Gensler and Janet Yellen and all the rest, they're sitting on their hands whether they're just moving slowly because they want to make sure they got it all eyes dotted and T's crossed before they put the clamp down, or they don't want to be seen to take an action ahead of anything because they don't want to be accused of precipitating the bus. Mark my words. And by the way, I have already won two steak dinners, two lunatics, or one lunatic, no, two lunatics, bet me last year when crypto, Bitcoin is around 35000 and then again at 44000 in this last summer, we had a bet on Bitcoin. And it wasn't, is it going to go up or down? No, no. These guys are nuts enough. <laughs> Who wouldn't have taken this bet? They bet me Bitcoin's going to 100,000. So Bitcoin, would by, by the end of 2021. So Bitcoin just went to 99,000. I would have won the bet. Suffice to say, it only got as high as 65 and it was over. So I won two steak dinners off of people last year. And a couple months ago, I'm a nice guy, believe it or not. I wanted to give the loser... The guy who bet me at 35 that was going to 100, I wanted to give him a chance to make his money back. So we made another bet. And I didn't even have to bet. It wasn't even break even. He was crazy enough to bet me again that it was going to go to 100 this year. Like, okay, someone wants to hand me money. I understand from uh, a mutual Twitter friend on here, a guy who's always in these rooms, he was in one of the clubhouse Bitcoin maxi rooms today, and apparently they're talking about me, talking about the bet, because this guy made this bet in a room full of 400 people. And, you know, it's the lack of humility. It's the lack of introspection. It's the arrogance. It's the certainty, which makes me so convinced. I, I shouldn't be so convinced, but which encourages me, leads me to believe that this is going to be a total wipeout. In other words, prices will not bottom. Let's go back to the Kathy Woodstocks. You know, she's taken in money 10 of the last 13 weeks. John Rook, please call your office. She took on 300 some odd million the other day. Last Thursday, I can't remember who, said, who pointed it out. Last Thursday, it was Gnostic or somebody else. There was a record day of inflows from the retail investor into the market. They all viewed Thursday as a great buying opportunity because – Jerome Powell said they weren't going to raise rates 75 basis points the day before. These are things you don't see at bottoms. The positioning is all wrong. The 
I will take positioning over sentiment any day of the week. So I could not be more bearish on crypto. MicroStrategy is going to go bankrupt. And by the way, again, please look at the podcast I did today with BlockWorks. You think I'm nuts? You can actually see me going crazy on the podcast. Michael Saylor's company, MicroStrategy, went down 99% in the, in the crash, in the dot-com crash. He wound up, I think he was either admitted or denied guilt, a huge settlement against MicroStrategy. He had to wind up paying, I think, seven or eight million bucks out of pocket. This guy's a lunatic. People don't change. People don't change. And what I really we talk about trying to promote financial literacy in this room, the people that are doing this, they just don't know anything about financial history. I feel badly for them. I'm not mad at them. They're just ignorant, financially ignorant. Again, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not to your own facts. At least study your history, get the facts straight. I'm kind of going off on a rant. Hey, Zev, good to see you. You want to talk about Tether and uh, crypto a little bit, Zev? Zev, you there? I'm not sure yes. Zev is. Zev. Hey, George, I want to add one footnote because um, it makes me concerned about regulation. And that is we had a former comptroller of the currency go to Binance as a crypto enthusiast, the head banking regulator. What does that mean to you? There's regulatory, great crush, there's regulatory capture up and down the waterfront. A little tired. I've had a couple of beers. I forget her name, but one of the one of the uh, commissioners for the CFTC, she's a Bitcoin maxi. The Bitcoin maxi is one of the chief regulators. Like really, you have Sam Bankman Fried, FTX contributing five million dollars to the Biden campaign, and I don't want to make this about politics. It's not a question of left or right. They all do it. All right, massive regulatory capture on steroids. And so, you know, our politicians, our governments are failing us. And people are just pulling stunts left, right, and center, getting away with whatever they can try to get away with. So, no, you're totally right, Bobby. Thanks for the question. Hey, Zev, are you back yet? Hey, yeah, back. sorry. Sorry. Yeah, my yeah, Zeb, my yeah, kid is Zeb, going Zeb, nuts, but, yeah, I, but Zeb, I'm listening. Yeah, Zev, could you, could you talk a little bit about, you know, you and I did a lot of work together last summer. We haven't talked much in recent months. Right, on Tether. Yeah, can you talk about Tether and crypto and particularly – I'm sure you've learned a lot in the last few months. What's sort of the updated? I mean, we all kind of, we all were convicted. We knew what the facts were. We just said, you know what? As long as regulators don't do anything, let's just, this is a losing battle. But right. do you have any hope that things are about to change or do you have any opinions? So I, the, A, the regulatory framework on crypto and then just B, as you know, it's always about number go up and that number ain't going up. So mm-hmm. you think a lot of the crypto bro are now going to start to like number go down. Let me out. So well, talk about what, crypto a little bit. What's amazing on number go up is the tether market cap keeps going up. It's over eighty billion now. Um, basically, what we what we we kind of came to is you, you, there's no way to prove what's backing it. They say it's pegged, but it's more like an off the books, like fractional reserve banking system. But it's sh- like so. If you don't know what's backing it, it almost acts as like a digital counterfeiting operation. Like you know you know what I mean? Because they're saying it's worth a dollar, and what's really scary about it is. You remember, we spoke to people who, I, was it, I forgot what country exactly, but they were talking about they're using Tether as the main kind of currency because they, they didn't trust what they were, because where they were was, you know, super hyperinflation. So if that, if that peg breaks, you know, that, then it's kind of scary. And then the other thing was a lot of the leverage in the crypto system seemed to be built off of Tether. You know, we, so... You know, George, we were in those rooms. We were kind of told we're nuts and, you know, like none of that matters. We, we never really got a good answer. But you do see, I mean, I, you do see stories today about other stable coins starting to break the peg. So it is, it is interesting to watch. Um, but like you said, until, until something happens on the regulatory side or until you know exactly what's in the reserves, you know, the show goes on. So we'll say. Hey, Zev, did you see, um, I saw this guy, .com, who's a fairly famous uh, website guy, internet guy from a few decades ago, said something about uh, they were going to ban the, the stable coins in America. Did you see something about that? 